Hello. Our story begins on the barren wastelands of Tatooine. Inside of one of the major cities of the planet, there is a boy. One with a midichlorian count higher than that of any living being on record. Or at least a record inside the Jedi archives on Coruscant. A rare chance of fate completely altered the life of the boy named Anakin Skywalker. Things he would never know about changed his destiny, and because of it, his life as a slave remained, at the first evil moment, permanently. Not far from his home world, the Queen of Naboo was able to break free from a blockade with no damage done to her personal star cruiser, allowing her easy passage to the core worlds. Anakin didn't know about any of this. The mundane life of a slave did not permit such luxuries. He never knew of anything going on outside of local politics, thanks to Watto, pod racing, and his mother. Anakin was returning from yet another day, slaving away at Watto's shop. He had a couple of extra parts that he could use to work on his pod racer. It was the only thing that gave him any semblance of hope. His dreams were becoming a professional pod racer. The thought filled his mind with happiness, and it often was the last thing on his mind before he went to sleep most nights. It was much different to some dreams he had, but becoming a Jedi would never happen. Kids like him, on this planet and planets like this, never got visits from the Jedi, let alone being welcomed into their order so far away. He walked over to a small pod racer and opened up one of the engine thrusters and started toying around. A couple of his buddies from around the block asked him if he wanted to join them in some sort of game, but he politely declined. It may have been a little pretentious to act the way he was, but he knew as a slave he needed to build a future for himself. He had to secure it for himself because no one else was going to do it for him. With the Boon to Eve Classic coming up in a day or so, he needed his racer to be ready so that he could race in the event. A win at the Boon to Eve would put his name on the map. Perhaps he could be picked up by Jabba the Hutt or someone else with a big name in the game. For him, it was a huge deal. He knew that he wanted to be picked up by someone like Jabba because that would gift him luxuries he could only dream of. Anakin worked with dedication in his heart and focus in his eyes. It wasn't that just winning would get him the money, but it would get him the freedom. Despite Anakin's dislike for the crime families, due to them being slave owners themselves, he couldn't deny the truth. They had the power on the planet. Even if he disagreed with them, he still needed to play their game to get by. To get a sponsorship from Jabba would be life-altering, and they give a lot more than just freedom for himself and his mother. Of course, it wasn't quite freedom. It was more or less an indentured servitude. He would still have to work for the Huts as a professional racer, but it was much better than being a worker inside Wado's little shop. Anakin worked for hours on his pod racer, breaking past the pain of blistered fingers and the heat of the twin suns beating down his back as he worked. His mother always hated the idea of him having a fascination with being a racer, but she never really believed it would get to a point where he could run with it. She just hoped he wouldn't hurt himself. It wasn't that she didn't encourage him or the dreams that he had for himself. It was more that she just didn't want him to get hurt. Pod racing was extremely dangerous, and most humans couldn't participate in it, let alone nine-year-old boys. When the sun set, Anakin finally went inside and spent time with his mother before it was time for him to go to bed. Anakin had to be ready for work tomorrow. The day after, he was going to participate in the Boon to Eve Classic, and he was going to win. He was excited, but an excited mind needed to be put to sleep so he could be full of energy when the time was right. The morning came and Anakin was up before the suns even crested. His first order of business was 30 minutes or so to play around C-3PO, his protocol droid. 3PO was a work in progress, but someday, he'd be a great asset to his mother and him. Anakin loved the thought of being able to free his mom from slavery, and then helping her with her life and anything else she wanted. Giving her 3PO was his long-term gift idea. While he was working on 3PO, he ran into the kitchen and grabbed a portion muffin and then put it into a heating tray and watched it come to life while he was shifting some parts around inside of 3PO's chest. It brought him joy to watch it come to life as he turned back and started working on the droid again. Every couple minutes he'd take a bite before finishing the muffin and sauntering off to work. As a slave, he had all the mundane tasks to do, and because of his servitude, he had to open up the shop and clean everything up before the first customer started to arrive. Anakin also had to move things around, like fronting smaller items inside the shop itself and cleaning up the walkways outside in the small courtyard. Watto didn't usually arrive until a couple hours after the suns rose, so Anakin had to attend to some of the first customers. It was a bit of a drag, but most of Watto's customers loved little Annie. He was kind, welcoming, and quite the bundle of joy to have around. Anakin helped them get whatever they needed and checked them out. When they weren't customers patrolling the shop, he was simply finding smaller tasks to pass the time. Things he figured Watto would like him to do. By this point, he kind of already knew what Watto wanted, so he just did it before he got to the shop. It actually helped him a lot. While Anakin was a slave, Watto was pretty decent to him. As decent as anyone could be while owning another person, which isn't really saying much. But for Anakin, it was a big deal. 
mostly because Wado was really the closest thing he had to a father figure. And being that that was the case, he was super excited to tell Wado about his aspirations to compete in the Boon to Eve Classic tomorrow. Wado did like the idea of this, mostly because he didn't want his slave competing in a competition and damaging himself. He had high hopes for Skywalker. He'd be a great long-term investment, and if he got hurt during the race or died, it wouldn't be worth his investment, which would be a loss of profit for Wado. He only wanted to make money and save money, and having Anakin compete was a risk to both of those. The Tordarian didn't believe that Anakin would be a big man by any means, but he would force him to work until he was. He'd be great at selling material, and he could probably get a good bundle package for both Skywalkers once Anakin was 15, 16, or even 17. He told Anakin that he didn't think he should participate. Anakin was a little rebel anyways, and he was excited and expressive about the racer he built for himself. He didn't just want to waste that machine, so he told Wada that he would participate in the race and that was where his heart was. The slaver just shrugged his shoulders and told Anakin to suit himself. Of course, it would never be that easy, so later that day, Anakin was given time to get off early so he could go and play with his pod racer and have himself ready for the race. Wada wasn't going to just stand for anything like this, so he let Anakin believe he had himself a chance at racing, only for that to slip away from him when he least expected it. This was mostly due to Wada believing that a 9 year old boy wouldn't notice if something went awry with his pod racer. Again, being that Watto didn't want to damage his property, he sent a group of smugglers to Anakin's racer to steal some parts. This happened in the late evening when Anakin had already gone to sleep. It was just another day of working on the racer, so for Anakin, nothing was all different. When he woke up in the morning, he still didn't notice anything as a couple EOPs transported the pod racer to the hangar bay before the race. This was a racer's last chance to fix any issues their vehicles might have. If they didn't believe there was anything wrong, then there should be no issue with getting to the starting line and beginning their race. Anakin didn't notice anything until he got to the garage. Then he noticed a slew of issues. He began looking around his racer. There are a couple things missing. They weren't obvious things either, but being that he put the racer together himself, it was very clear to him what was missing. There are a couple plugs on the left thruster, a couple cables missing in the center console, and his visor was taking off his helmet, which was just really weird. And then in the right thruster, there were a couple things that were missing, but just placed in different locations. Anakin quickly got to work as his mother tried to suggest that maybe it was best to not participate in today's race. But Anakin had already put the pressure on himself that if he didn't win, his mother would continue to suffer. Shmi, of course, had no clue about any of this and believed that Anakin was having delusions of grandeur. She didn't want him to get hurt, and she tried to dissuade him. But Anakin knew his pod racer. He knew what was wrong with it, and he could fix it. It wouldn't take too much time. He just needed to do it quickly. He attached some spare cables he had in his toolbox. He was lent a pair of goggles for his helmet, and he was also able to borrow a couple plugs from another racer. It wasn't that big of a deal. The only issue was rearranging done to the one thruster. He quickly worked through it, and then the hangar's alarm sounded. It was time for all the racers to make their way to the starting line to prepare for the race. Anakin scrambled as quickly as he could and looked at his work. Everything seemed right. He had a small cheat sheet that he collected together over his time of manufacturing his racer. The cheat sheet was something to just keep around while he was working on it so he knew what each combination did. If a certain cable and plug were together, then the ignition would start. If another wire was misplaced elsewhere, it would stall the engine out. Nothing too serious if it didn't work, which it would work, so no need to worry. Obviously, Anakin had a lot to worry about. This was a race for his mother and his freedom. A couple of friends showed up, but not for nothing. He was disappointed that most of them didn't come. It wasn't a terribly big deal, he was just hoping that someone else might show up to support him. Those who were here with him would come with him to the top. When he thrived, those buddies would thrive with him. Real simple. Everything was perfect. The racer was on the track and everything looked to be ready to go. Every racer's flag was paraded in front of the starting line, before they were given the signal. A couple of the racers, most specifically Saboba, bantered with Skywalker, but it wasn't anything Anakin wasn't used to. He handled it expertly and prepared for his first real challenge. As the racers started their engines, Jabba rang the bell and a quick 3, 2, 1 passed by as the race started. Anakin wasn't the only one, but his racer stalled out. He quickly got onto the controls and tried to figure out what was going on. He flicked the switches and pulled the levers, trying to re-engage the thrusters. He felt so embarrassed, but this wasn't the worst of it. He kept messing with the thruster controls and one of them ignited but slipped off, flying through the air and slamming down in the middle of the track into a massive explosion. Anakin saw a red blinking on his console and panicked as he jumped out of the racer and ran as fast as he could. The racer he spent so much time building and making perfect in the hopes that it would free him from slavery exploded behind him. He was launched forward and crashed into a concession stand nearby. Anakin looked back over the fires burning in the middle of the track. His heart sank into his chest. He couldn't believe it. He looked around the raceway to see people all murmuring. Up in the announcer's booth, there were jokes being made at Anakin's expense. 
He looked around and saw his friends on the other side of the track with horrified expressions on their faces. Anakin turned away and walked as fast as he could from the raceway. Shmi was in the stands as she quickly made her way down towards Anakin, but by the time she got down there, he was already gone. She looked around, but couldn't find him. Anakin's friends came over and pointed her in the direction he went down. When Shmi ran out of the racing arena, she couldn't find her boy. He just vanished like a ghost into the crowd. She knew he would come back at some point, but that didn't matter. She was determined to find her boy. She ran out into the seas of people moving around on Buta Eve Day. It was such a big celebration on Tatooine, especially in Mosespa, so the streets were crowded, though it was easy to find Anakin, in a way. There were crowds of people splitting up as he ran through. Everyone just watched his racer explode on their screens. Seeing him run past them elicited a couple emotions. Macho individuals just laughed at him because he wasn't able to control his pod racer, and that's what he got for trying. Regular people felt either pity, shame, or genuinely sad for him. Others just kind of avoided the entire thing. He was a nine-year-old running through the streets completely embarrassed and his mother eventually caught up to him to tell him that it would be alright. He obviously was an emotional wreck and she comforted him, hugging him and telling him that everything would be okay. He was just so frustrated and when they broke off their hug, he walked around in a circle, pacing around. They were away from the crowds by this point so there was plenty of room for him to move around like this. She told Anakin that failure was a natural part of life and he threw his hands down and expressed that this wasn't failure. It was an utter embarrassment and even worse than that he lost his pod racer. How would he race now? He couldn't salvage anything. The entire thing was destroyed in the process. His frustration and anger broke apart as tears started to fall from his eyes and he told his mom that it was unfair. He was supposed to be the racer to free them from slavery. Now they were stuck. She realized now what racing meant to him. The whole point of winning wasn't for the money or the accolades or anything. It was for their freedom. Shmi told Anakin that that was never his burden to bear. It was unfair, sure, but it wasn't his fault. She always wanted to get him out of it, but there was never really any easy way around it. They didn't make money so she couldn't buy their way out of it. It was just bad luck of the draw. But the main point is that she didn't want him to feel responsible for it. She would help get him out of it, maybe not now, but at some point, and that was a promise. Anakin thanked her, but he also apologized. Shmin just smiled and took his hand, walking with them back to their home. Anakin would have nightmares for the coming nights, going into weeks. Losing his pod racer was a crushing thing to his morale. He needed something to focus on, and while 3PO was getting more work than ever in the past few weeks, it just wasn't the same. The pod racer was his dream. Being a racer was all he wanted, and now that was stripped away from him. He had to find a new dream and evolve. Because just like every other kid on Tatooine who wanted to be a pod racer, they'd have to choose the path that better suited them, or did they? Anakin kept up a positive outlook, regardless of how difficult it was for him. They still got their weekly portions and despite some teasing from Wado, not much had changed in his life. Anakin just put more effort into 3PO. The protocol droid was coming along rather quickly, which was a great relief. There were a couple pieces being put onto his armor and so forth. As the hopeless days went by, Anakin's friend group started to detach themselves from him, which made everything worse. He didn't want it to happen, but he just didn't go out and play much anymore, so everyone collectively just moved on without him, having their fun and forgetting that he ever existed. It's not that Anakin wasn't outside anymore, it was more or less he wasn't always outside, because 3PO was always inside. Though during a walk back from Watto's shop, he was stopped by a member of a local crew. Anakin looked over and realized that it was the leader of the crew. Mos Espa and Tatooine had a bunch of these little crews or gangs. They all worked for Jabba, but they were allowed to police around under the authority of the Daimyo. Anakin recognized the crew boss. His name was Jalem Lithil. Hey boy, aren't you the kid whose racer exploded during the Bunta Eve? Hi, Jalem. What do you want? Nothing. How are you holding up after losing your racer? Look, Jay, I don't have time for this. I'm tired of being made a joke of. What do you mean? I'm just asking. Clearly you're not. You're trying to get a rise out of me, and it won't work. Who's picking on you? I'll have my boys teach him a lesson. No need to be hostile. We're pretty much the same. We are nothing alike, Jalem. Yeah, we are. I lost my treasured item when I was a youngin' too. I just didn't have someone who had my back. What are you trying to get at? You got a spark. Just trying to see if you wanted my crew. It's a way out of the system. You may be a slave for a little bit, but at least there'll be an attainable future for you. Jalem, I don't want to kill anyone. The thought of taking someone's life just freaks me out. You ain't got to kill anyone. Just join the crew. You'll get protection from Jabba. What about the gang fights? What about them? We stop them. We're not instigators. We deflate situations. How about this? I'll think about it. Sounds good, kid. I'll see you around. Anakin walked away. He was surprised Jalem recognized him after so long. He didn't really understand why he'd be asking 10 year olds to join his crew, but there was a reason. Jalem had been recruiting a lot of kids into the crew. He needed depth for the future of the group, 
If he didn't build it up now, he would lose it all in the future. Politics on Tatooine were always really rugged, and so, being that the gang fights could happen, and even crew fights happened, there was always a lot of death. People were constantly being killed, and it was Jalen's job as a crew boss to hire people into the crew. Plus, the reason he thought that Skywalker would be a good candidate was because of his quick reaction skill during the pod race. While millions of people saw a scared little boy, few on the planet, like Jalen, saw someone with quick reaction time. Whether or not it was a reaction to seeing a light indicator beeping, it was still a fast reaction, which is something that should be prided. If Anakin could move quickly, then he's someone who would make a good grunt or even a leader. Not quite a crew boss, but they'd have to see. Usually, the following weeks after the Boonda Eve were hectic. Gangs would start fights over a number of reasons. The two leading reasons being either gang won a ton of money or bets, and the other one to steal it from them, or a gang bet too much of something and they didn't have the money to pay it up, so others came to collect the credits. It was a time for cleaning out bad gangs in the area. Of course, Jabba allowed it. Competition was good for business. There were always fights between crews and gangs, and he didn't really care. They were all fighting for him, or claiming to be fighting for him, when in reality they were trying to grab a manufactured power gap that just simply didn't exist. It was Jabba's way to make the little guy feel big. They would get stuck in the ride of the rat race, always fighting, clawing and bickering their way to the top of the system that would never feed them the way it fed him. Jabba's influence was generational, and once all the first generation people died out, there was no one really to look at the system he created and think of it as unfair. It just became socially accepted, and the people lived in a constant state of fear. Slavery and piracy ran large, and no one could come to save them. The only way out was up. Even if it meant just shoving the person next to them under, just so they could get a taste of the pot of credits that didn't really exist. Jabba's rule was firm, and because the crews and gangs constantly feuded with each other, he just thrived off of it. That didn't even go to the extensive power he had by bringing outside supplies into the planet like weapons, spice, and an assortment of other people pleasures. Just things to keep the mind occupied while the body destroyed itself in service to the hot cartel. People like Jalen were victims, and they passed their victimhood, without even realizing it, down onto the kids of their neighborhoods. Not for nothing. Aside from the survival of Anakin, Jalen didn't really see real potential in Anakin. He just had this presence. He carried himself with respect, and someone like that would be great in the crew. If he didn't want to be a fighter, he could be a mechanic. But no harm in teaching him how to spin a blaster and fire it, right? Anakin returned home and continued working on his droid. 3PO was coming along nicely, and Anakin began putting pieces together onto his body, just covering up the naked circuits as a means to make the droid feel a little bit more comfortable. He found such joy in doing this, and despite not having his racer around anymore, or a whole lot of friends, Anakin was able to find happiness within himself. It wasn't something that always came easy. With Shmi by his side, he was able to get the comfort and the change of minds that he needed. Anakin's birthday came and went, and as a 10-year-old he decided that it was time to take Jalen up on his offer. He went back to the crew house one evening when he got done early, and he was welcomed in with open arms. Jalen was excited to have Skywalker show up on the front step of their little cantina. They called it a crew house because it was their little zone. No other crews were allowed to enter, and people who paid tribute to the crew had special access. Essentially, it was a cantina that pandered to a particular group of people to get protection from the outside, though it didn't mean that they'd always have a target on their head from crews across the city. When Anakin walked in, the people of the crew house all cheered him on. This was entirely intentional. Jalen paid close attention to Anakin after the little encounter a couple weeks beforehand, and he noticed that Skywalker had little to no interaction with anyone else his age, so this hyping him up when he came in here was meant to pull him in closer by giving him some sort of that brotherly love he'd been missing. It was a good way to lower his guard and make him feel safe, and trap him with them. It was a nice manipulation tactic, but it worked so well. It was much easier to do with kids and down of the luck individuals on Tatooine. Jalen yelled out and told everyone that there was a free round on the house in honor of the arrival of Anakin Skywalker. The bar let out a huge cheer as they turned towards Anakin, raising the drinks into the air. A couple people coming in from the back patted him on the shoulder as Jalen told Anakin to come with them. All the euphoria blinded his senses, and so he followed right along. There was a small shooting range out back and Jalem asked Anakin if he ever shot before, and he just shook his head. So he asked Anakin if he would like to try, and he shrugged his shoulders. Jalem pulled his pistol from his belt. It was a K-16 Briar pistol. He spun it around in his hand before gently handing it over to Skywalker. He knelt down and pointed at the sights and everything else on the pistol. He was more or less just helping Anakin get a hang of this whole pistol thing. Once he was done explaining everything to him, he told him to unlock the safety whenever he was ready and pull the trigger. Anakin looked over at Jalem and then fired at the target. Anakin smacked the target with a perfect hit. Jalen jumped up and yelled out with excitement and told Anakin that that was beginner's luck. He pulled out a couple more bottles and lined them up across the front of the target. 
He told Anakin to hit those three bottles. Anakin smiled and raised his hand, pulled the trigger three times. All three bottles were hit. Only one of them was clipped, which wasn't that big of a deal. Technically, it was a hit. Jalen ran over to Anakin's side and told him that he was a great shot so far. Anakin jumped up with excitement, adrenaline running through his body. He told Jalen that he thought that it was fun. So Jalen told Anakin that if he wanted to come by after his work, he was always welcome. Jalen told Anakin to keep the pistol and pulled a small patch from his pocket and slipped it into Anakin's hand. He told Skywalker that he was welcome to the crew anytime he wanted to join. While Anakin was familiar with the names of the crews and gangs in the area, apparently he wasn't. The group that Jalen was a part of was called Dragon's Breath. They got their name a couple generations back when the founder of the crew told stories of apparently killing a Kray Dragon. He was renowned for saying the Dragon's Breath could choke a sand person. The name just came from his obsession of telling the story. Many people at a certain point refused to believe him, even though it actually was true. Those who did believe him decided to rally behind him and then Dragon's Breath was formed. Ever since then, it had been a powerhouse in Mosespa, though it always struggled, simply due to Jabba's fair play rules. There were caps on how large a crew could get and how many crew locations they could have. Typically, the way the show's strength was through elite numbers, updated vehicles, and so on. It was very common for members of the crew to polish their vehicles like they were being stored inside of Coruscant garages. It was just another example of the poor trying to be like the rich. And in those particular cases, it was a collective poor on Tatooine against the people of the core. Anyways, Jalen believed that he could convince Skywalker to join Dragon's Breath as a mechanic and then give him the idea to become one of their gunners, or whatnot. It was worth a shot. Anakin took his new blaster and the small emblem and escaped back home. Without knowledge of Jalen's plan, he just kind of hid everything under his bed and went about his normal activity. Daily activities, if you will. The following day, Jalen would approach Anakin again as he was going home from work. Hey Skywalker. How was your day, buddy? I hate Wada. I just hate him. What did he do? He found out I was using parts that no one bought for my protocol droid. Luckily, he didn't take the droid, but he told me if he ever found out I was doing that again, he would sell me to the Zagarians. Well, we can't be having that, can we? What do you mean? With protection from Dragon's Breath, he could handle your little problem. It just means that you would have to work for us long term. Doing what? Well, you'd be a mechanic if you wanted. I'd even take you under my wing. Why not? I told you I don't like death. I hate him, but that's not really up my alley. Okay. How about this? Working for the crew will get you paid. You can buy you and your mom's freedom. I'd honestly rather do that. Welcome to the crew, kid. Anakin just looked at Jalen with a blank stare, but the crew member knew how to handle the situation. He told Skywalker that if he wanted to take a look at the shop, he could. Anakin nodded his head with a little convincing. As Skywalker came closer, Jalen put his arm around his shoulder and told the boy, that there are surely going to be parts he could use to build the droid if he wanted. That uplifted Anakin's spirits, but not anything like what he saw when he entered the shop. It was attached to the cantina that Dragon's Breath called home. Anakin looked at all the vehicles. Most of them were speeders, but behind it, it was a starship shop. They were mostly quick little ships, mostly vessels that could break past blockades or do smuggling operations. It was a way for the crew to make credits on the side. The operation wasn't large, just competing for the manufacturer control they believed they could attain. Jalem told Anakin to go check it out. Skywalker lit up with excitement as he ran into the room and looked at all the pieces and parts. Some of the other mechanics knew that Jalem was pushing for Skywalker to become a part of the crew, so they were welcoming upon his arrival. It was another good way to help recruit new kids. It wasn't like they would just treat him any differently when he was a member, it was just more or less them upping their standards to get him to join them rather than the other groups and crews around the city. After a couple hours, Jalen tossed Anakin his spare credits and told him that it was his first day's worth of earning. It wasn't really much of anything, but it was the first credits Anakin ever earned. He was so excited at the idea of making money for himself, so he thanked Jalen and then told him he'd be back tomorrow. Anakin did keep coming back. His main goal was to save up money to buy both his mom and his freedom. Shmi was left in the dark of all this for the most part simply because he knew that she wouldn't approve of him joining a crew. Though, even Anakin believed that she would have accepted it because of the new energy he had every day. Shmi only wanted Anakin to be happy, and while she would have been upset about the news if she found out, she was just happy to see Anakin come home with joy on his face. She did get curious where all the credits were coming from, and Anakin told her that he found a mechanic shop that believed in him. It was technically not a lie, but he also just left out parts that included him doing target practice for fun and becoming friends with one of the crew bosses of Mos Espa. When Anakin reached the age of 15, he was one of the better members of the crew. He was still technically a slave, but his time with Dragon's Breath over the past five years really opened him up to a world he'd yet to encounter. As a kid in Mos Espa, of course he saw it, but he never really lived it. Being a slave gave him so much protection, and because he was still a slave, he had that protection, but Anakin was getting antsy. Watto didn't know Anakin was in the crew, 
but he could assume based on the fact that Anakin was always hanging out with members of the crew. Though one thing that set him apart was the fact that he never wore crew colors, or their patches, so it was hard to call him a member. Anakin did this because he was still a slave, and technically he couldn't become a full-time member until he was a free person. The only reason Anakin wasn't free by this point is because Water refused to accept pay from Anakin. Essentially, once Anakin started making money from the crew, he asked Watto how much he needed to buy his own freedom. He was given an outrageous price, but he worked for it. Dragon's Breath appreciated his work, because without it, they would have had some struggles when it came to crew-related conflicts. His work on their motives of transportation allowed them to secure pieces of the territory without much struggle. Anakin worked overtime to make the money only for Watto to raise the prices on him. This happened three times in the past five years, and while that might not seem like a lot, Anakin saved up his money for at most two and a half years, only for Wada to tell him that the prices increased due to Anakin being older. It wasn't really that true, but it irked Anakin a lot. He was getting really good with fighting. He knew a couple moves that would be considered martial arts, and he was poetic with a blaster. This only made him more antsy to kill Wado, but he held off. Until one day, he snapped. It was a normal day for Anakin. He was doing manual labor for Wado inside the shop. Just as he had for years, a man came into a shop and his name was Cleek Lars. He was going to buy Shmi, but Wada, with the assumption that Lars wouldn't pay the price, told him that if he wanted the mother, then he'd have to buy the son. This was far too expensive for Cleek, and so he left the shop. Wada refused to give up Anakin or his mother, unless he got a good price, and currently, the huts weren't budging either. They saw the potential in him, but not worthy of being bought at the moment. This was mostly due to the mother, because Wada refused to sell them separately. The huts, more or less, saw Watto as too greedy for his own good. Despite Anakin not wearing crew colors for the duration of the past couple years, he finally donned them. He was going to kill Watto himself. He saved up money for five years and he could secure his mother a nice place to live, which would be even better in his own mind. He would get the pleasure of killing Watto and freeing his mother, and himself from slavery all in one go. Not to mention providing for her so she could be kept safe. Without thinking, Anakin went to jail him and told him he was ready. By this point, everyone knew what he meant. They were going to help initiate Skywalker into the crew fully. He was already a member by their own views, but as is tradition, all members must carve the crest of Dragon's Breath into their first victim's throats. It was as vile and disgusting as it sounded, but to Anakin, nothing sounded better. It was early evening and Watto let Anakin get off early that night. It was the last mistake he would ever make. He turned around to see Anakin enter his shop, and within moments, he was on the ground with his wings flapping violently trying to escape before a blood-curdling cry could be heard echoing out from the shop. The crest was planted in his neck, and the crew left to celebrate Anakin finally joining the crew. They spent all night at the cantina partying and enjoying their time. Dragon's Breath was at its peak, and while Anakin was one of the youngest members of the crew, Jalem had a reward for him. He brought out a crest patch of a lieutenant's position. It was the highest position in the crew that wasn't crew leader. Jalem gave it to him because Anakin was always in the shop. He was a great shot, he was humble, and he always looked after his friends at the crew. Anakin's brotherhood with the brothers and sisters of Dragon's Breath was everything to him. With Watto dead, and an official marking made by the crew, Jabba would not interact with the situation, so Anakin was safe. There was a reason for this. Jabba believed that if a crew marked a body, then that meant the individual was bad for the greater good of the community of Mos Espa, or whatever city it was. It allowed the crews to feel like they had power and influence, when in reality, it would only stoke the flames of war, and this did. Anakin, after a long night out with his family, returned home. He was going to tell his mother in the morning about their freedom, and that wherever she wanted to live in the city, they could move there. He had an idea, but he wanted to wait till morning to tell her. She had been looking for a home in the upper parts of the city. It was mostly peaceful up there, and it was pretty much upper class of the poor. It was a place where people felt like they were special, when in reality, they were just like everyone else. They just were situated on top of the little plateau. Anakin was so excited, though. Of course, it would mean longer trips for him, but anything to make his mother happy. He went to sleep that night, and in the morning he woke up grabbing his muffin portions and setting it up as he would any other day. 3PO had some polished padding around him. It wasn't beautiful, but it was nicer than most protocol droids on the planet. Anakin ate his muffin and looked for his mother. She walked out of her room and looked at him and asked why he was so excited. He told her that he had terrific news for her. Wado died and now they were free. She smiled and kind of nodded her head, agreeing that it was good news. Shmi didn't really process any of it, so she walked to the kitchen before turning back with her eyes wider than the twin suns. Anakin was giddy with excitement as they hugged each other. So many years of torment finally over. They were free people. They laughed and hugged for several minutes as Anakin told her that all the money he saved up could be used to buy her a home wherever she wanted. She just needed to name the place and he would get it for her. Shmi smiled and sat down. She told him that there was no need for that. This was her home right here. She didn't need to go out looking for anything else. She was happy right where she was. But Anakin, he could buy a starship. He could go out and see the galaxy. Anakin smiled at the idea. 
but then remember the whole crew thing. One couldn't just leave the crew, they were bound to it for life. So Anakin just nodded his head, thinking that he could do some spice running or smuggler type jobs, and tell her that he was actually out seeing the galaxy. Technically telling the truth, but not the whole truth. Anakin gave her a handful of credits and told her to go out and enjoy herself for the day, and every day that followed. She smiled and thanked him kindly. She grabbed something to drink while Anakin went back to his room to work on 3PO for some more. There was something wrong with his eye that needed fixing. Once it was done, he would go out to the crew and get some more clothing. It didn't take more than a minute or two to get the eye to work. He grabbed his K-16 pistol, slapped it on his belt, and then prepared to leave. Shmi was perfectly fine with him having a weapon at this point, considering Tatooine had gotten worse over the years. She was happy with him keeping himself safe, especially since that mechanic shop he worked at seemed to care so much about him. Anakin called out and said goodbye to his mom, as he exited the home and slammed into something that jarred him back. He fell backwards and felt his face. Why was it wet? He looked up and saw a body, lightly spinning around in circles, hanging from the ledge of the door. Anakin looked at the side of the wall and saw the markings of the twin son's gang. He got up and quickly pulled his mother down, but she was already dead. Her neck snapped under the weight of an early morning breeze. Her last thoughts and the excitement her son shared for what he could finally have with her after so many years of disappointment. Anakin ran out into the street and smelled burning. He looked back and he could see the apartments that ablaze. He thought of 3PO at the last second and ran in to save the droid, being that it was the last thing he had left before an explosion threw him into his feet. Anakin's face was covered in ash as he rubbed his eyes clean and ran into cover, pulling his blaster from his belt and looking around. Luckily for him, a sandstorm had rolled in. He could see the fires burning and he could smell it too. His mother and 3PO were gone. The thoughts replayed in his mind over and over again. His mother and 3PO gone. His mother and 3PO were gone. He hid behind a crate and took a deep breath, trying to process what just happened. He got up and ran for the crew location. As he ran, he slipped over and fell over things in the way, hardly finding his way back to the cantina. He stumbled in as Jalem asked him what happened, quickly bringing a wet cloth over to his face and wiping the blood and ash from it. Anakin stuttered out words, none of them making any sense, but one of the crew members in the corner understood. He told Jalem that the twin sons struck again. They must have aligned themselves with Watto. The reality is, Watto aligned himself with them. He mostly figured out that Skywalker joined Dragon's Breath, and he decided that he would get himself protection. Obviously, they didn't care about him. They wanted a reason to fight for power. They now had an excuse because Dragon's Breath killed a twin son's shop owner. Anakin asked them what they did now, and Jalen turned to the crew and told them, prepare for war. The crew quickly got together as messages went out to crew members across the city as they mounted up their weapons. The Twin Sons was the largest other group in the city. This battle between the two largest crews in Mos Espa. However, one would essentially be untouchable for the foreseeable future. They'd be able to bully all the other gangs in this mission if they wanted, considering there were no rules about doing that, just caps on how large a crew could get. Dragon's Breath saw this as their chance to take the throne, the same one for the Twin Sons. This was their chance to finally take a hold of Mos Espa, all for themselves. The crews were getting ready. Jalen told Anakin to stick with him. He was a good shot, but this was much different than target practice. This was all out war. Each crew had a different location to start, and the people of the city knew it was coming. The streets very quickly emptied out as the war approached its beginning. Dragon's Breath didn't make the first move, but they drew twin sounds out into making that move. Dragon's Breath sent a larger speeder that was covered and didn't really work out into the middle of the street and twin sons bit the bait. They opened fire on the speeder and they exploded, ripping through buildings, killing civilians, and so forth. Inside of Jabba's palace, he watched a hologram layout presented in front of him. All the scum were ready, because Jabba would put out hits on different people to make the game a little bit more fun. They took the sense of control the gangs had away from them to weaken their morale, but he wouldn't do that unless the battle went on for too long. He knew that the people would get tired of their daimyo if he didn't stand up for them once in a while. Jabba could very easily wipe out both gangs if he wanted, but no one knew that. Anakin and Jalem moved in, side by side. One of the more militaristic individuals was taking the lead for Anakin in this mission, which the passing of the torch went by really easily. The main focus was winning this battle. The streets began to fill with blaster fire as the crews found each other. Dragon's Breath took an early lead, and the explosion at the beginning really helped with that, though they needed to hold that advantage. Jalen broke off for Anakin as he led a group of elite fighters down a different path. They were going to ambush the twin sons on the far side. Anakin was fighting behind doors and alleyways, ducking in and out and using his amazing shot to lay down covering fire. He was fighting with fire in his eyes. In his first test of battle, he rose to the moment. The killing that he was so afraid of had vanished. He was seeing nothing but red in this moment, chasing the victory that he believed he deserved. As the fighting intensified, men around him started to drop, and he was quickly becoming surrounded. 
Dragon's Breath had become arrogant with their stance as the most elite gang in the city, and Twin Suns were making them pay for it. Because Skywalker was ambidextrous when it came to using pistols, mostly in part the Jalem, he quickly got the work using two pistols and shooting down the opposition threats. He was locked down in a corner with the Twin Suns ganging up on him, until a rocket launched past him and crushed into a building setting it ablaze. A number of civilians died in the blast. It was a shot that came from the Twin Suns, a misfire. He turned around and shot the rocket man as he let another pistol go and it slammed down into position right in front of him. But it wasn't close enough to do damage, instead, it flipped the speeder on top of a Twin Suns gang member. Anakin smiled before blasting his pistols forward, seeing an advantage in front of him. He spun out from behind the cover and started forward. The few men and women who were bunkered down with him looked up in awe as he cut through his foes. They got up seeing this as their chance to retake the advantage. Anakin blasted away, sidestepping more blaster fire and avoiding rockets of the sort. A massive tank came down the alleyway, and he and the crew ducked out of the way. Skywalker turned back and saw a rocket lying on the ground. He told the crew to cover him. He lunged backwards, sliding across the sand as his crew members were blasted away by the heavy cannon. He grabbed the rocket and launched it forward. It was a perfect shot, slipping right down the barrel of the cannon and forcing the tank to explode. Inside Jabba's palace, he chuckled at the resourcefulness of the scum. He told Bib Fortuna to have someone figure out who that kid was and keep an eye on him if he survived the battle. This wasn't favoritism, it was turning a profit. If the kid was able to survive, he'd be a good bounty hunter in the future. But like all great prospects, it was a matter of time if he survived or not. In the streets of Mos Espa, the Twin Sons began using people as cannon fodder. Anakin and Dragon's Breath had finally gotten some control over the battlefield, but they couldn't risk pushing forward because it could cause more civilian casualties. As they were doing a fighting retreat, Dragon's Breath was under fire from another group. It was much smaller, and they were rather despised by everyone else in Mos Espa. It was a group called the Tuscan's Marksmen. It was an all-boys club, and they were boys. Well, at least they acted like it. Gatekeepers and so forth. They just loved to provoke the loss of brain cells, and the worst part is, they were all terrible shots. But they wanted to throw their name in the hat. They saw the two sides fighting, and they believed they could earn favorability with the Twin Suns by fighting against Dragon's Breath. But it wasn't working. Both sides collectively turned their attention to their mutual foe, and fired at them. Mostly because Twin Suns couldn't see Dragon's Breath at the moment, and Dragon's Breath was pissed off. Just as they fought off the Tuscan's marksmen, a counter-assault came from Jalen. It was the cavalry too, the most elite gunsmen in Mos Espa, and the counter-assault worked like a charm. However, Twin Suns knew they would lose this battle, so they prepared. They approached the civilians that were left in the open, and they were bombed. The worst part of all of it is that Jalen recognized it before it happened, so he's able to reroute the troops at the last second. The bombs exploded, destroying wings of homes, bunkers, and medical facilities. Most of the casualties were innocent civilians who were trying to avoid the gang war. Jalem had two choices, and he chose the one that best represented him in Dragon's Breath. He went and helped the people. Anakin and his pinned down squad saw this, so they broke out and made their way over the Jalem and the rest of the crew. They were pulling people out of the rubble as the more elite gunsmen kept an eye out on the perimeter. People were outraged, and while the gang fights were common, this was a war. While the consensus is that Dragon's Breath started the conflict, it was now understood that the true agitators were twin sons. Anakin came over and helped people out of the rebel. Some of them he carried, others he and a couple other members of the crew put into a safe location, until the firefight started again. Anakin saw a young woman about his age ducking under the rebel. She was the last one to survive the bombing. Anakin had just carried her grandmother from the wreckage of their home, and now she was in danger. He didn't want any innocent civilians to die in the firefight, and from his perspective, it was another civilian. He moved forward with the rest of the crew as they noticed their opponents were taking up higher ground. Jalen told Anakin to head up the stairs with him. Before they ascended, Anakin pulled a piece of rubble over to cover the young woman's side. He moved up and as he got to the top, Jalen was shot in the chest. He fell backwards and landed on a spiky satellite. He cried out in agony. Anakin was in shock, but he didn't have time to react. He turned his attention forward and opened fire. Anger in his face, tears in his eyes. The Twin Suns members were cut down as they tried to fight with him. Some of them got close enough to him where they were able to engage in fist-to-fist -fist combat. Anakin ducked and weaved. He was really good on defense, but offense was a little different. Jalem threw him his personal blade as Anakin took the weapon and spun it in his hand as he jabbed it into someone's neck before kicking them off the roof. Skywalker was kicked in the back of the head and he stumbled down, but Jalem put his hands out and caught him. Anakin thanked him before turning back and shoving the blade into a man's stomach before twisting it. He pulled his pistol from his belt and slapped it onto the man's shoulder, using him as a stand as he opened fire into some of the other crew members that began to retreat. Skywalker threw the body down and ran over the Jalen's side and asked if he was alright, trying to help him up. The rest of Dragon's Breath began rushing forward to finish off the twin sons. Jalen took Anakin's hand and told him firmly, using all of his strength to say every word he needed Anakin to hear. I love you, kid. You know I do. This place... It's not for you. Get off this rock. Go live a life you deserve to live. I'll always be proud of you." Anakin held Jalem's hand until it went limp and he fell back, 
onto his deathly still body. Anakin shook his head. This couldn't be real. He couldn't lose two people in the same day. As he was standing there, he got communications from one of the other crew members. Anakin, we got him on the run. Come join us. An explosion ripped through the air as the audio cut out. Skywalker turned over and his heart sank into his stomach. That was the last of Dragon's Breath. All the remaining members had just gone over to fight off the rest of the twin sons, but it was evident they wanted to exterminate the entire crew. There was no playing around. After decades upon decades of finally losing, they figured out how to break past the crew. Anakin was the last member left. They'd be coming for him. He looked back down at Jalen's dead body and listened to the words over and over again inside of his head. He couldn't let Mos Espa suffer, so before he got off this rock, he needed to do some work. He looked down the street, the smoke plume still high in the sky. He could hear members of the Twin Sons gang cheering. They were loud people as it was, and he could hear them talking about finding him and gutting him in the city square. They were going to torture him for being the last one of them alive. It was their whole plan, which is why their final bomb was deployed. Anakin had to admit, the resourcefulness in such little time was very impressive. They got us all set up before morning and after learning of Watto's death in the early evening the previous night. Anakin patted Jalen's body and slid down the side of the burned up building. He grabbed his pistols and looked at them. He knew that this was his final stand. Still holding the K-16 Briar pistol that Jalen gave him when he first joined, he took a deep breath and looked down the street and could see about 30 Twin Sons members hustling down the streets. Anakin slid down and leaned his head back and closed his eyes. He was 15. How in the dune sea was he supposed to do this? He was sitting there. He heard a pss pss come from the right side. He turned his head over and saw the girl he saved. She waved him over and he shook his head and pointed over his shoulder. She pointed down the alleyway and held up a pistol. Anakin thought this would be interesting, so he got up and scurried across the street and followed her into the alleyway. She pulled him around the corner. First, I want to say thank you for saving my grandmother. Second, we can beat these guys. You just need to trust me. Why get involved in the gang warfare? You don't need to risk your life. Well, not for nothing. Your gang is kinda gone. And their gang will also be gone. Plus, if you target my grandma, it's personal. Fair point. My name's Anakin. Shh, no time for that. Look over here. We need to split up down this alleyway. Every two crevices, there's an opening. Use that hole to jump down, move back, jump up, and fire. Understood? Wait. Yes? I think? She shoved Anakin down the alley as he was trying to figure out what she meant. The young woman pushed Anakin down one of the crevices and pointed at a small latch. It clicked in an instant. What was this and how did she know about it? He didn't have time. The young woman ran back a little further and hid in one of the crevices. She used a couple stacked crates and boxes and climbed up to see if she could see anyone coming from higher ground. They were clear at the moment. She then heard them coming around the corner at the surface level. A smile formed across her face as she slid back down and kept her head peeled back. She'd wait until the guy started firing. Anakin used a mirror he had in his pocket to see over those who were entering the alleyway. He had it on his person at all times, just to keep a cool looking hairstyle for the crew. He could see the twin sons move in, their ugly badge shining in the sunlight. Anakin waited until they were a couple meters away from him as he peeled around the corner, lifting his pistols and firing away. Chaos caught them off guard, a couple of them being killed by their own men as he started to charge in at Anakin, and he opened up a latch and jumped down. At the same time, the young woman opened fire, which completely blindsided the men of the Twin Sons. She clapped a couple kills before a heavy gunner made his way down the alleyway with a rotator cannon. The woman dropped down into a hole and met up with Skywalker down there. She told him to move, and he didn't. The two of them popped up in two different crevices after she told him about the heavy gunner. When the two of them got to the surface level again, they both found a means to climb up to the roofs, and so they did. Anakin was on the right side of the alleyway, and the woman was on the other side. As they got to the top, they looked over, confirming seeing each other. This wasn't planned, it was completely coincidental, but they smiled at each other with confidence. The thugs made their way into the alleyway below them, looking for the two attackers. Anakin kicked the box down as it crushed the heavy gunner in the head. His pistols opened fire as the young woman ran past him towards the street. A few of the remaining members were making their way up to the top level as she ran forward full speed, kicking one of them in the throat as he toppled backwards before pulling her pistol and firing into the faces as they tried to ascend. Anakin cut down the few remaining members inside the alleyway before getting over to the building adjacent to the young woman. She pointed down the street, it was the last member. Even worse, it was the leader of the Twin Sons. He survived the onslaught and still had the courage to try and run away. Anakin pulled his pistol out and aimed it, and fired it to precision. The blaster bolt slid through the air and clipped the man right in the back, killing him instantly. When Anakin turned around, he noticed the woman was gone. That was weird. He made his way over to the street level and got down, asking if the people were alright. Most of them were. A lot of them were injured, but Alive was certainly alright in their books. After that battle had taken place, they were more than just happy to be breathing. Anakin then remembered the bomb that went off earlier. 
before the twin sons came looking for him, so he ran forward to check it out. By the time he got over there, he just looked into the sea of dead bodies. He had taken so long, most of them bled to death or were simply killed in the explosion. The colors of Dragon's Breath littered the street. Anakin slid to his knees and took it all in. He felt so terrible what had happened. He knew he technically couldn't blame himself, but he wanted to. It felt like the natural thing to do. Sand filled around his knees and he felt the heat beating down on him. The battle lasted past high noon, and the middle of the day was excruciating. Anakin grabbed the hot sands from the ground and balled it up in his fists. He thought about Jalen's final words to him and took them in. As a 15 year old, it was hard to grasp what the trauma had just done to him and what he had been through. If anything, it felt like the terrible dream and he would wake up tomorrow with his mother and Jalem and Dragon's Breath and everything would be alright. But that tomorrow didn't exist anymore. The two biggest and longest standing gangs were completely destroyed. Anakin had no place belonging in the Dragon's Breath anymore because like his friend said, he needed to get off this planet. While he was taking in the sight, the young woman who helped him survive the battle came up and asked him if he was alright. He turned over to her and nodded his head quietly. She just told him that she wanted to thank him for saving her grandmother. She understood that in the moment he didn't want to hear it, but if they never saw each other again, she wanted to make sure he knew that his efforts would be treasured for a lifetime. Anakin looked up at her, her face covered in a silhouette as she stood in front of the twin sons of Tatooine. What's your name? And how did you know all about that stuff? I'm Xana Pax. And you know, girls gotta eat. I'm a spice runner. Anything that's necessary for survival. You're Anakin, right? Yeah, that's me. I just want to- No need to thank me, Anakin. That was my thanks to you. You want some help up? He nodded his head, and reached out his arm as she pulled him up. The two of them turned towards the destruction. Zena made a witty, but kind of sick joke about how Mos Espa couldn't get any worse. Anakin just laughed a little, and twisted his head towards her. She shrugged her shoulders. Comedy was a good way to deal with trauma for her. The two of them started the discussion as the people started to fill the streets again to see the end of the conflict. But not just that, the two largest gangs in Mos Espa. Zena and Anakin started to head back towards where her grandmother was, as he asked her about being a spice runner. She didn't have much to say about it other than the fact that she was able to do it because it paid for her grandmother's health issues. As they got back, Anakin learned a little bit, but not much. All he got was the fact that Zena's parents had died before she was five years old. Before they could continue going any further, Zena asked her grandmother how she was feeling, and she was doing alright, she just wanted to head back to bed. Zena turned over and looked at the apartment and suggested that that probably wouldn't be the best place to sleep at, because it was an open bedroom. Anakin suggested that they use the Dragon Breath Complex. It was a little ways away. It would be a little bit gross, considering it was a group living quarters, but it would be fine. Plus, Jabba and his men probably wouldn't burn it down until the end of the week, after it was confirmed that both gangs had been destroyed. It was a way for the city to move on collectively. If a gang destroyed another gang, that either captured it or burned it to the ground. If both gangs were destroyed and survived, by no heirs to the throne, as it were, then all their facilities would be burned. This would give time for survivors to grab their things before the end of the week was up, though it would likely put a target on their head, especially if they were rude to other gang members, which was never going to be an issue with Skywalker. We never really interacted with members of other gangs up until today, so hopefully the few survivors of the Tuscan's marksmen didn't remember his face. The trio walked over to the area and they had a long conversation. Zenith's grandma, who just went by Grandma Pax, told Anakin that back in the day, she was once a spice runner, one of the best in the galaxy. Might explain some of her lung issues, but that's alright. She had the time of her life for the 45 years she did it. One of the best runners during the end of the Nile reign in the Outer Rim. She had tons of stories, but not for nothing. The day had left her elated and she was ready for some rest, which she was able to get, along with some of the medical supplies she needed, thanks to what was already inside the facility. When they put Grandma Pax to bed, Anakin and Zena walked up to the roof of the building. It was still daytime, but the evening was approaching quickly, and it gave the two new allies time to talk with each other alone. Anakin and Zena very quickly understood they were actually the same age, which was kind of funny because both of them thought that the other was older by a couple of years. Anakin knew being a spice runner wasn't easy, so he assumed Zena had to be 18 or 19. But no, she was just really good at it thanks to some tips and tricks her grandmother taught her. Zena thought Anakin was older thanks to his lieutenant patch from Dragon's Breath, but they were really just both the same age, which made everything a little funnier to them, though Zena was older by only a couple of months, considering Anakin just turned 15 but that didn't really matter. As the Tatooine sons began to set, their conversation only continued to build up. They told each other about their lives, and Anakin got to learn about his newest ally and how she ended up in the place she was. As she told him, she was born in the city over in Mos Eisley. She honestly didn't remember much about her parents. All she knew is that her mother had the most beautiful blue eyes and her father had the finest hair she'd ever seen. In the Outer Rim, having fine hair was a great treasure, and to be complimented on it was an even greater one. Zena told Anakin that her family wasn't killed by the gang war, rather it was something much more horrific. 
A group of Tusken raiders got a bit tested with the spaceports existing and they attacked the outer layer of the city. Because the attack was so surprising, most people fled. There was a battle or a siege that took a number of days. Zeno's father was a part of a group of defenders, mostly just people who operated outside of the gang life and acted as middlemen to make sure civilians didn't get hurt in gang-related activities. He died during the first day of the siege, and on the fifth day, before the Tuscans were driven out, they set fire to the side of the city they broke into. Being that they were so used to the extreme weather on the planet, they perfectly predicted a sandstorm, so the fire spread with intensity, and since Tatooine consistently had low water supplies, a quarter of the city was burned to the ground. In the confusion, their home caught on fire, and as they escaped, her mother was trampled to death by people running in confusion. She wasn't the only person to suffer such a fate that night, but it was the last time Zena saw either of her parents. Anakin asked her how she ended up out here in Mosespa. She said that she snuck onto a civilian transport and she was brought out here. While Zena was still very young, Tatooine was kill or be killed. She knew where her grandmother lived, so she just needed to find her and where it was, being that it had been so long since she visited her. Luckily for Zena, her grandmother was about to come to Mos Eisley after her child hadn't responded to her a number of days. To find Zena and learn that her parents died was heartbreaking. She felt terrible, but she decided that in that moment she would raise Zena. Zena was her grandmother's pride and joy. She taught everything she learned over her vast career to Zena, and she took all those skills in stride as she became a spice runner. Anakin asked her about the spice runner life, as if he was interested in partaking in it. She expressed that he probably wouldn't care for it. In all honesty, it was tons of moving around, doing missions, and sneaking past people who could gut you with the glare. Anakin kind of liked the sound of those new adventures. Zena leaned back and smiled, telling Anakin that he'd probably make a better bounty hunter. He asked her why she thought so, and she told him that he had the grit for it. She never liked the idea of hunting people down. She was basing her assumption off the of Skywalker's killing spree during the day. Someone like him would be able to make a good use of his skill in the bounty hunting game. Anakin laid back and looked at the stars. He never really wanted to be a bounty hunter, but the path ahead of him seemed to be leading towards that life, so he told her that he would think about it. Anakin, despite not knowing what he wanted to do with his life, asked Zena what she wanted. She shrugged her shoulders, admitting she never really had time for what she wanted. There was always taking care of her grandmother for her. She stopped and expressed that she didn't mind either. She definitely wasn't complaining. More or less, she just was stating that she never had aspirations of her own. Maybe she would have some in her future, but her main concern was taking care of her grandmother. Anakin kind of nudged her forward and tried to see if there's anything she really, really wanted. She turned to him and looked up at the sky and said that she wanted to get off this dust bowl. She wanted to be happy and she wanted to have peace. She expressed her hopefulness for a gig to go right so she could get her big break. You know, the spice run of all spice runs. One where she'd be able to bring home more than enough credits than anyone could imagine. She could buy a star cruiser and make it a gambling cruise. And then she could live on it and make continuous profit while running around the core. It sounded like a fun idea. She then joked about how fun it would be to be the daimyo of Tatooine. Someone who could have real change for the people or whatever. Anakin giggled at the joke and then thanked her for her kindness. She asked what he meant. And he stayed silent for a moment before telling her that he lost his mother and his best friend today. Though not for nothing, his best friend was kind of like a father figure to him. Anakin had mentioned all of it to her, even the situation regarding not having a father, but he kind of avoided going back to the topic of those people dying. She could only assume, but she didn't want to say anything until he said something. Zena sat up and asked him if he was alright. He mirrored her by sitting up too and shrugging his shoulders. He said he hadn't really processed it yet. That was a difficult thing. Once he processed it, it would probably be a lot more difficult. The two of them sat in silence for a couple of minutes before falling asleep on the roof of the building. They were woken by a banging at the door in the early morning. Anakin sauntered down quickly as he opened the door for a man of Jabba's palace who asked him if he was Anakin Skywalker. He nodded his head. The man asked if he'd be able to accompany them to speak with Jabba the Hutt. Anakin rubbed his eyes and asked what that was about, and Bib told the young man that Jabba saw potential during yesterday's standoff. He would like a chance to speak to him about a job opportunity in the near future. Anakin nodded his head while covering up a yawn. He didn't really process what was said to him, so as he entered the room again, he walked up to the top where he and Zena had fallen asleep, and she asked him if he was going. He looked over at her with a confused look on his face. She pointed at the edge of the roof. He looked over, and then it clicked. She could hear the conversation from the top side. Anakin shrugged and sat back down. He told her that he'd go check it out. She smiled and urged him to do it. Something that surprised Anakin was Zena's seemingly selfless personality. She just wanted to help people, which was a rarity on Tatooine. Despite Jalem's kindness to Anakin, he had other motives. He needed people for his crew, and Anakin was cheap and easy labor. Zena wanted Anakin to genuinely succeed, and he was appreciative for that. One thing that stood out even more than that was the fact that she didn't seem at all jealous about the chance for Anakin to get a job that would give him more than she currently had. Zena had been trying to get a job with Jabba for years. The only thing she could manage was local gigs. But being that Anakin picked up on this, he would make a mention to it of Jabba upon his arrival. 
At least at the moment, while he was confident, it didn't seem like that big of a deal. But standing in front of the crime lord himself was much different. Telling Jabba to his face would be a lot more tantalizing. Anakin got himself ready and told Zen that he would come back and speak with her if he could. She just laughed it off and told him to go. When Anakin arrived at Jabba's palace, all of his confidence had seemingly disappeared. He understood a little bit of Hadi's, but he was rusty with it. Biff Fortuna brought him back into the Master's throne room, and Anakin stood before a bunch of the galaxy's most renowned bounty hunters, smugglers, and spice runners. It was a bit much to take in, but he was ready to accept whatever Jabba wanted to say. Just a domingo lepa, ni chutu tanki sabiska, chikopo wungina. Almighty Jabba, I'm grateful that your excellence sees my potential. What services are you requesting of me? Well, you named two of my greatest attributes, Jabba, but I'd like to help out a friend. Skywalker could feel the wandering eyes in the room lock onto him. He felt really stupid sticking his neck out for Zena like that, but then he saw the pay stub for the mission and what his mission was, which was literally nothing. Collect a scavenger from the Ryloth system. Then he saw the requirements. If he was brought in alive, that'd be more credits. If not, no biggie, just less pay. Anakin couldn't believe his eyes. Luckily, he had the credits to get a ship and buy some supplies for himself. It walked up to him, handed him the tracking fob, and showed him a hologram of the man he was meant to be hunting. Didn't look too difficult. Anakin bowed before Jabba and left the palace in a rush. When he got back to Mos Espa, he found Zena again and asked how she was doing. She was fine, nothing much was happening. She just found out that the ring of spice runners she worked with had been discovered by a rising gang and had been taken out, but she couldn't really complain. The most recent battle kind of saved her life. If the battle didn't happen, she likely would have died in the conflict that cracked open her spice runners guild. Anakin was apologetic for her loss, but she was alright, no need to dwell on it. Plus, she was excited for Anakin's new journey. He didn't say anything to her about what he said to Jabba, he'd rather just keep that a secret. If she betrayed him, then he would at least know that it wasn't worth his time. It would also be a good gauge to see if she was willing to keep herself around as a loyal friend than just to gain something from him. He asked her what she would do now. She was optimistic. Because of her grandmother, she knew where all the permanent Spice Runner's guilds were, so she would probably just go out and investigate them first. He was happy to hear him. She wished him luck on his journey and said that maybe they'd see each other around. Anakin kind of nodded his head and walked off. He stopped and turned back to ask if she'd like to help him pick out a ship, but she was gone. That was odd. Though Anakin noted that she was always like a ghost. Zena Pax could just disappear under the suns and reappear when she wanted. It was who she was. It's what he learned about her the previous night. Being a spice runner really aided her in that particular way. Anakin kept turning back every couple feet to see if she'd just magically reappear, but she didn't. How odd. When Anakin got to a starship yard, he was given the basic rundown of prices and so forth. So Anakin had to walk towards the back of the lot, because all the cheaper vessels were back there. But he saw something that caught his eye. It was a Corellian engineered ship. Not just any ship, but a fine bounty hunting ship. It was a YV-666 light freighter, and it had a rusty paint job. Bathing in the sun every day certainly didn't help, but it wasn't Anakin's range. When he went inside the vessel, he could see that it actually was really well maintained. It was just at the back of the lot and had been there for a very long time simply because of bad paint job. A great representation of judging a ship from its cover. Everything else was fine in the ship. Anakin bought the vessel and quickly got himself all the extra supplies he needed before filling up the YV and preparing to depart. He didn't really want to waste time with his mission. Anakin got himself in the hyperspace and moved into the middle of the ship to investigate everything he didn't review while he was in the shop. Anakin found sacred hatches, his bed, and a couple of other things. He started looking around and began envisioning what he would do with the interior. He thought of a hollow table in the corner, a rack of gear and weapons, maybe a trophy case for his best captures or whatnot. He was excited looking at it all. Maybe it wasn't what he originally wanted to do, but as a bounty hunter, he could take advantage of what initially seemed like a bad situation. He was content with the situation at the moment. He looked at his gear and started siphoning through it. He had a couple of bombs and grenades that he got from the local arms dealer. It was someone he and the crew went to all the time. Because Anakin was a part of the former crew, he got a good deal. He let out the supplies he would probably use on Ryloth. First was a K-16 pistol, which had a stun mode on it. Another thing was probably the cufflings. Obviously, there was so much he needed to learn about the art of bounty hunting, but this was at the very least a start. For his first trip through hyperspace, or even his first time in space, he didn't know how to feel. Part of him was excited, part of him was nervous, the rest of him was kind of monotone about it. He sat in the bay by himself, lying down on his bed, and looking up at the ceiling. After this mission, maybe he'd get a partner or a droid to go along with him. It would at least give him some company in the ship. Not for nothing, the silence of the ship rattling through hyperspace gave him time to think about the loss of Shmi and Jalen. 
He didn't really have time to get through it or think about it, let alone process it. So much happened so quickly, and now he was alone for the first time in his life. He always had the support in the background. While Zena was kind, there wasn't a guarantee that she would stick around. Anakin thought about the idea of her. The idea was nice. Maybe he was thinking about it too much, but at the moment, it'd be choice to have her next to him. It was a bit of idealistic visioning, but at the very least, it was comforting to think about. He found a small hologram device and opened it. How interesting. It was a ship log, and the previous owner put a bunch of holo recordings on it. When Anakin opened it up, it was a female Twi'lek. She never said her name, she just talked about her journeys inside the ship of what she called Nighthawk. Anakin did not like the name, so he decided he'd call it something else. But he listened for hours until he arrived inside of Ryloth. It was like a show. He was hooked the second he started listening into it. It gave him insights into her life and how it was being a bounty hunter for her. Though she never said anything about what her name was, it was all hidden. Probably intentionally, but Anakin had a lot more time to go through it when he finished the mission. He made his way down and pulled the ship down into the capital city of the planet. As he exited the ship, he looked at the hologram and then looked around the city streets. He realized this would be much more difficult. The Twi'leks all looked pretty much the same to him. At least that interpretation was based on the crude image on the hologram, so it would be much harder for him to find the guy. Anakin stepped out of the ship, his boots clacking against the surface of the ground as he began walking into the city streets. Skywalker looked at his fob and saw it begin to blink. He walked forward patiently. He knew, or at least assumed, that he shouldn't be holding his fob outside of him, so he placed it into his jacket pocket. The fob vibrated, and he could feel it vibrating against his chest as he moved through the streets. There were people from around the galaxy here in the markets and walking around. Skywalker kept his eyes peeled as he ducked into one of the markets to fit in. He picked up a couple of fruits and stuff, looking around at everything. The shop owners talked to him, but he barely engaged with them. He just moved around, taking everything in sight. The fob began to vibrate more and more. He turned his head back and saw a man covering his head and walking through the street. Anakin pulled the fob out and saw the man's name. He turned back and called the man's name out quietly. The man stopped and looked around trying to find who it was that said his name, before turning back and running. Anakin slipped between two people and then put his hand on someone's shoulder to give him enough momentum to jump over a kid instead of running them over. The man he was chasing slipped but caught himself. Anakin sped up. The Twi'lek began to run through the crowd as Skywalker put his hand on his belt, but sped forward knowing he couldn't pull the weapon in a crowd of people. The man continued to evade Skywalker until he was tripped by a stand. He caught his foot on the edge of the stand and Anakin booked it around the corner, pulling his pistol and shooting a stun round into the Twi'lek's head, and it knocked him out completely. Anakin walked over and wrapped his wrists up in the cufflings. He turned around and looked at the people walking by. It was the outer rim. No one cared. The guy was caught, and the bounty hunter could kill him if he wanted to. Anakin reached down and lifted the man up over his shoulders and carried him back to the starship. Eventually, when he returned, he threw the man down onto the ground. He could see the pipe that was stuck onto the wall, and so he unshackled one of the wrists and put the cufflinks around the pipe and then tightened them up. The man was still unconscious and he wouldn't wake up until they were in hyperspace. Anakin went to the cockpit and lifted the ship out of the atmosphere and jumped the hyperspace. When it was done, he came back down and listened to more recordings done by the Twi'lek who owned the ship before him. As he was listening to her, he pulled the patch off his jacket and stuck it to the wall. He knew what he would call this old rust bucket. The name Dragon's Eye sounded cool to him. It'd be a nice way to remember his crew, but also make it more of his own thing. Plus, he thought the name Eye was a bit cooler than Breath. Maybe that was just him, but it sounded better. The captured man tried to bribe his way out of the situation, but he wouldn't get that luxury as Anakin just ignored him until they flew down the Jabba's palace. He was allowed to park in the hangar bay after scratching the roof of his ship on the interior of the bay. When Anakin walked out, Bit Fortuna told him to work on his piloting skills, which was something Anakin said he would do. He was apologetic for the little incident, but he was forgiven, no biggie, no one got hurt. The prisoner was taken away by some of Jabba's guards. Anakin, on the other hand, was brought back to Jabba's throne room, where he was waiting eagerly. When Anakin arrived, there was a bit of a party. It whispered into Anakin's ear and told him to take a seat and enjoy some refreshments with the other scum. Anakin nodded his head and walked over. He was a bit nervous about the potential cliques around this area, but that wasn't an issue. Most of the bounty hunters got along with each other, just out of mutual respect. If someone didn't respect you, you knew. Most bounty hunters saw Anakin as a new kid on the block. One of them waved him over and sat him down at their table. They talked to him for a little bit, getting an idea of the mindset behind him and what he wanted from his line of work. Anakin just shrugged. He was excited, but he just didn't know what to expect. For the bounty hunters, there was sort of this honor among thieves mindset, which gave them the confidence to tell Skywalker some tips and tricks. Of course, each bounty hunter kept their best secrets and tricks themselves, but the basic stuff? Sure, no issue. After they asked a series of questions and got some tips and tricks to each other, Anakin asked about the singer. One of the bounty hunters leaned over and said her name was LDR. She just caught a big break and she was making her way to Coruscant to be a performer at large venues. Jabba wanted to have her around before she got out that far into the galaxy. It was like a goodbye celebration. She had been with Jabba for the longest time, and finally after so many years of hard work she was getting her chance out in the core. 
and it can enjoy the show and continue talking with the other bounty hunters. It gave some tips and tricks about who to work for. While bounty hunter could work with each other and other syndicate groups, it was probably best for Anakin to avoid working with the Pikes or the Zygarians. They were the worst to work for him, but the Pikes have been getting better as of late. Anakin didn't realize it, but he wouldn't have those same luxuries. Many of the other bounty hunters didn't know it either. At the moment, they assumed Anakin was someone from off-world, but since he was Tatooine born, he'd be a contract bounty hunter, which for Jabba meant that Anakin could only get jobs from Jabba himself or the Hot Cartel which would either be on Mal Hutta, on Coruscant with Zero the Hutt, or on Tatooine. Anakin didn't know this until he approached the almighty Jabba the Hutt after LDR finished her performance with Jabba, though she did promise him that she would come back and perform a high production show for him once a year or once every couple years to thank him for all he did to get her to where she was now. Skywalker then got the stand before Jabba, and he waited to hear what the crime lord thought. <laughs> Would we do a public a hot Thank you, Almighty Jabba, for your hospitality and belief. My friend is a spice runner, and a damn good one at that. I think she'd make a good member of your crew. Thank you, Jabba. Also, I'm ready for your next hit, whatever it is. I'll take care of it as fast as I can. Jabba pointed the Biv Fortuna who walked forward and brought with him the first true challenge for Skywalker. Just like any bounty hunter under contract with the Huts, Anakin had an easy first mission to complete. If his ego got high, then chances are he would die in the following bounty. If the individual were able to remain calm and collected, then the following bounty would have no issues for them. Anakin took the Fob and the Hut Cartel pendant with him and thanked Fortuna before making his way back down to the hangar and leaving the palace. Instead of going out to the galaxy to finish the mission, he decided that he'd go back to Mos Espa and tell Zena about the potential opportunity. He landed in one of the many landing zones and even paid someone to repaint his ship so it looked newer. It also seemed like he was here for a reason. The best part is he was still doing this with credits he earned while he was still with the crew. The credits he just got from Jabba he could save for a while. Anakin walked through the streets for what felt like hours, and then he eventually found her. She was outside of a new apartment complex trying to do something. He startled her, which elicited a firm punch to the shoulder. She asked what he was doing back and he shrugged his shoulders. He just said he was here to tell her that if she wanted, he got her a chance to work for Jabba. Zena looked back at him with confusion on her face, and she asked him what he meant. Anakin handed her the Hut Cartel pendant, and told her that sure she paid him back and whatnot, but he was going to be completely honest. He felt like he owed her for helping him in that skirmish. She asked if he was sure about this and he nodded his head. She gently took it from his hand and told him that she was very appreciative. She didn't know how to thank him for such an opportunity. He shook his head, telling her that there was no need for thanks. The two of them stood silently staring at each other for a moment before Anakin asked her what she was doing over here. She shrugged her shoulders. She was looking for a new place to call home. She was hoping that she could use some of her inside knowledge to blackmail the owner to let her and her grandmother stay here, but she wasn't sure if this was the right place or not. Anakin asked her where her grandmother was, and she said that she was currently inside of the ship. It was technically Zena's, but her grandmother was the one who bought it and used it for spice running for all 45 years that she did it. Anakin nodded his head, and then he remembered that when she was done, or if she had the time, he just bought a new starship, and her talking about it reminded him. She told him that she would love to see it, but maybe later. Anakin just smiled, and he told her that he could show her when he got back. She asked where he was going, and he smiled, putting his hands on his hips, telling her that he was just going to become one of the most ruthless bounty hunters in the Outer Rim. Zena chuckled and nudged at him, suggesting that with pearly whites like his, he wasn't going to scare anyone. Anakin rolled his eyes at the notion, but it was all in good fun. He also handed her his communication frequency and told her that she should contact him whenever she wanted. She took it and looked at him with a raised eyebrow, and told him to get going with a glimmer in her smile. She turned back around and giggled to herself. This was a place. This was the guy she had dirt on. She could blackmail her way in. No one wants to bring their grandmother with them while they're being a spice runner. She turned back to see Anakin walk through the crowd. Anakin could feel her eyes on him, and when he turned back to see her, she was gone again. Gone like a ghost. Like a whisper, too sweet to hold on to and too quiet to last forever. He twisted his head a little before turning back and going to his YZ666 light freighter. He got in and looked at the fob. It was a trip to Florum. This wouldn't be fun. He was targeting a pirate inside of a pirate base run by Hondo Anaka. Anakin knew of him by reputation and then realized that he'd have to do this silently. He couldn't be so open about this job, but he had what he needed. The supplies he picked up would be with him on this little mission. He popped up the dragon's eye into the sky and blasted off in the hyperspace. During his trip to Florum, he did a lot of the same as he did the last time, and the trip through hyperspace. The mission was very easy, he just had to confirm the death of the target, though as he was listening to the Twi'lek recordings, he fell asleep. 
For better or worse, he ended up waking up when one of the saucers that belonged to Hondo intercepted him upon his arrival from hyperspace. Anakin woke up with bloodshot eyes and then ran to the cockpit to tell them that he was just here for some food and drinks. He heard that Hondo threw the best parties in this side of the galaxy. He was given permission to land, but that didn't mean he would just get permission to live. As the ship landed in the landing zone, Hondo came out to see the man who claimed he had the best parties around. Hondo definitely didn't disagree, he just wanted to see if he knew the man who said it. To his surprise, he wasn't a man, just a 15 year old boy. Hondo was so surprised, but he looked a little closer and saw that Anakin's eyes were bloodshot. He let out an egregious laugh and told the boy to come with him. He really had him for a moment. Hondo really thought that Anakin was some type of bounty hunter or whatever trying to kill one of his men. Regardless of their crimes, Hondo's men were his, which is why they were loyal to him as pirates. If they had issues with others, Hondo would just smooth talk his way out of the situation for them, and in turn, the pirate would be eternally loyal to him. It was a good way to do business. Hondo put his arm around Anakin's shoulder and handed him a drink. Anakin knew he could drink this because Hondo was just drinking out of it. The smell was horrible and the taste was horrific, but it's alright. Anything to get the job done for Jabba. They talked a little bit before walking into the building and seeing a massive party unfolding. Anakin realized that Hondo thought he was out of his mind, so he played the part of the fool and acted like he was in a haze. Hondo got Anakin over to a seat with a laugh and told the boy to eat up. They had the best sobering food in the galaxy over here. It would help him mellow out before he got back up, if you know what I mean. Hondo slapped Anakin's back harder and harder before stumbling away, forgetting all about the drink he gave to Anakin. The young bounty hunter brought everything he needed with him, and in his pocket, he could feel the fob vibrating. Before he landed, he looked at the hologram of his target to just make sure he knew he got the right guy. Everything was set up perfectly for him. The party continued swelling around him as he took it all in. This was the life. Maybe not being alone, but being a person on his own. He felt like a superhero. As he was sitting here, one of the pirates got up and lost his mind. He got into a fight with another guy at the bar. Hondo looked on amusedly as everyone in the bar turned their attention. Anakin knew it was now or never. He felt the fob and looked around. It vibrated as he got closer to the person he was looking for. As he saw the man, he was holding a drink in his hand. He wasn't paying any attention. The guy started urging the two of them to fight. After the first call for a fight rang out, a couple more did, and the first one was thrown. Anakin pulled a small vial from his pants pocket, bringing it up to his hand level, and twisting the cap off slowly between his thumb and pointer finger. A couple men brushed by him as they went to help out the man who was intertwined in the fight. This pushed Anakin forward, and he stood up on his tippy toes so he didn't slam onto the guy he was here to kill. The pirates all got locked into the fight as it turned into a brawl between the multiple people. Anakin yelled out, telling them to get him. It didn't matter who was on it. Anakin said it in the right ear of the man he was here for. The man turned over. Skywalker slid his body in front of himself and poured the vial into the drink. Uh-oh, the mixture wasn't the same color of the drink. And then he remembered that on the label, it said it would take 25 seconds to melt into a drink. Hey, that's what you get when you pay for low-quality poisons. It would do the job, but you might get busted. That was a risk of paying low prices. It was a great way to swindle people on Tatooine. Anakin saw it, and his eyes looked from the cup to the turning head of the man. Anakin slid the vial back into his pocket, wiping off his hands, and he turned to the man who was with him. The timer had begun. 24, 23, 22. Anakin got the man's attention, asking him who he had odds on. He shrugged his shoulders and said neither. He was friends with both of them. Anakin told him that he could put credits on it, and the pirate mind went off and he agreed to the idea. Instead of Anakin's mind, he was counting down 17, 16, 15. The man asked how many credits, and Anakin told him they should do 150 credits on the winner. The pirate was about to look down at his drink, and Anakin pulled some credits from his pocket and tossed them up in his hand and caught them. The pirate smiled and told him he had 150 on the guy on the left. Anakin watched the man who he would be betting on get crushed in the face. 9, 8, 7. Anakin told him to double or nothing. This was easy for him. He took the bet, and Anakin slammed the credits onto the counter and threw his hand forward. The pirate contorted his face and Anakin told him he'd only pay up if they shook on it. The pirate looked at him and took a deep breath. Four, three, two, one. Anakin and the pirate shook their hands together and Skywalker gripped him hard and swung his hand back and forth. The pirate was clearly annoyed with it and when they broke off, Anakin's guy had actually knocked out the other one. The worst part for the pirate is that it was a smaller man and a much larger one. But the bigger they are, the harder they fall. The pirate was so annoyed as he poured the drink and slammed the empty cup onto the table. He handed Skywalker 350 credits and told him that it was a good bet. Maybe next time he'd clear him out. Anakin winked and he told him he looked forward to it. Skywalker knew what he needed to do, and he needed to get out of here. The fight was intensifying as it spread to other members of the crew. Anakin ducked and weaved a couple people as he bashed someone's nose in and moved away from the fight. He could feel the fob still beeping in his pocket, so he turned around and watched the pirate he was just next to cough on the table as he slowly slouched over. The fob stopped beating and Anakin grinned as a confirmed kill. 
Anakin walked out slowly before quickly running through the courtyard to his vessel and jumping in. A couple pirates realized that the friend had been killed and they chased after Skywalker. Hondo kind of figured it out, but why start a fight with the Huts? If the bounty hunter was killed or captured on Florum, it wouldn't be a big deal. Plus, if the kid was hungry enough, he'd end up here on Florum again anyways. No issue, he could get his revenge then. Anakin was chased by a couple stray pirate ships, but he jumped the hyperspace by the time they were out in the atmosphere. When he returned to Tatooine after falling asleep in the bay area of his ship, while listening to more recordings of the nameless Twi'lek, he pulled the ship down to Jabba's palace. When he came into the throne room, he was mostly quiet. There were a couple people in the background talking to each other, but most of it was hidden under a smooth song playing through the speakers. Anakin came back with the biggest smile on his face, telling Jabba he killed the guy and he did it in secrecy. Jabba loved the energy, but he told Skywalker there were no more contracts from at the moment, giving him the suggestion to freely move about in the throne room with the other bounty hunters. Anakin bowed and turned around, scanning the dark room. There were a couple people playing games of Sabacc and other gambling games. He sauntered over into the darkness and leaned against a column, looking in on the action. As he was standing there, someone jabbed their fingers into his side and he nearly jumped through the ceiling. Anakin turned back with fury in his eyes, but then he saw a familiar face, and his fury dissipated into joy. He asked Zenna what she was doing here, with a wild smile across his face. She smiled and said that he invited her. Anakin looked away for a moment and then remembered that he did indeed invite her. She tugged on his hand and pulled him back to where she was sitting. It was two seats in the corner of one of the cutouts, and it had a great view of the game of Sabacc, with renowned up-and-coming bounty hunter Cad Bane. Anakin noted the massive hat in the bounty hunter, and thought it was kind of goofy, but not in a bad way. For a bounty hunter to have a unique slogan or call sign, that was important. Bane had that. Anakin turned his attention back to Zena and asked her about working for the Huts. She was ecstatic. She explained that she was able to blackmail into the apartment complex with that one guy, and Grandma Pax had a place to stay. Anakin inquired about how she was able to blackmail someone. She leaned back and said it was a complicated situation. The guy who owned it liked to hit on her, and considering she was like Anakin, 15, that was a big no-no. Despite the rugged rules of Tatooine, most gangs, criminals, and just about anyone didn't stand for that. So Zena was able to threaten his life for it if he didn't give her and her grandma a place to stay. Anakin was upset that the owner of the complex did that, but at the very least, the blackmail would buy her some time to earn some credits. He saw a bit of her cynical side where she said it wouldn't buy him any time. He would just be killed at some point, but she liked the idea of making him stress out over it. He wasn't the only one she did it to. It was whoever happened to exist within a radius of him type of thing. Anyways, Zena broke off from the topic and gave her the creeps just thinking about it. She asked about his most recent mission, and he told her all about the pirate fight and the poison, and she had to admit she was very impressed, but not for nothing. She did encourage him to become a bounty hunter, and he seemed to live up to the hype of it. She toyed with him, suggesting that he didn't look scary enough to be a bounty hunter, but not for nothing, it was more fun than it was an insult. Anakin asked her what she would be doing here with Jabba, and she admitted that, while it was a bit tantalizing, she'd be working for the Hut Cartel. She was both a little nervous and a lot excited. She'd have the chance to go to the core and run Spice. Obviously, it'd be more dangerous, but because of her stature, she'd be the perfect size to do stealthy missions in high-risk areas. Working as Spice Runners in the Hut Cartel was much different than Anakin's contract with them as a bounty hunter. Aside from a few situations where he might need to have backup, Anakin would pretty much be going in alone. As for Zena, she'd be assigned to a squad of Spice Runners and go from there. This was much larger than low-life Spice Running. It was work for the Hot Cartel, so she needed to be at her best, just as everyone else around her. They could be snitches and get you killed, or you could perform well and no one in your squad would complain. At 15, the stakes would be high, but for Anakin and Zena, the future would be bright and full of adventure. When both Anakin and Zena were 19, their respective fields of work would be completely changed. The Clone Wars had begun, and it was no longer a safe galaxy to work in. Neither field was safe to work in to begin with, but with the Republic and the new Separatist movement interlocked in the galaxy-wide war, the arena had just changed. Anakin and Zena were closer than ever before. For the previous four years, they were drawn together more, and they began to rely on each other more than they had anyone else, aside from the people that raised them. Zena's grandmother passed away when she was 17. And despite the difficulties it left for her, she was able to heal through it with her friend nearby. It was the same thing Zena was able to do for him when it came to the loss of Shmi and Jalem. As two individuals working for Jabba and at the top of their individual game, they rarely saw each other. Neither of them were the best in the galaxy, but they were performing at their best of their abilities since they started working for Jabba. Something noticeable to Zena was Anakin's desire to be the best bounty hunter he could possibly be. This was entirely identifiable by his decision to choose bounty hunting over anything else. He never sat still, and he never stayed on Tatooine for so long. Unless, of course, there was a job to be done. He liked to think of himself as loving and caring towards Zena, which wasn't inaccurate. There was just always one thing that came before anything else. His loyalty to the Syndicate was based solely off the opportunity he was able to seize from his lifestyle. 
Of course, being a bounty hunter seems solid in theory, but it required much more effort than was being paid back. Anakin had to continually update his vessel, his arsenal, some of his outfits, and pay for fuel so he could move between planets and get jobs done effectively. All these were simply necessities for the job. Obviously, outfits didn't seem the most important thing, but truthfully, if he had a job in the core, he needed to fit it. He needed to match the style. The huts moved him all around the galaxy. It was a rare sight for a local kid to be such a gunslinger. Anakin thought it was talent, but it was much more than just talent. But a good gunslinger didn't make a top bounty hunter. Before Jango Fett's death on Genosis, he was the top slinger in the galaxy. That title now belonged to Cad Bane, who had earned his colors in the years that had passed. Anakin was consistently vying for that top spot with the top bounty hunters, but that became increasingly difficult. With the war starting, there were more people in the galaxy trying to make their way with the syndicates and earn some credits. Despite the Republic using bounty hunters sparsely, the Separatists were hiring more often, and Cad Bane was getting in on that cash flow. It forced Skywalker to try and keep pace with the rest of the bounty hunters. Zena, on the other hand, was spending more time on Tatooine and Outer Rim Worlds than not. She wasn't as busy as Skywalker was, and she was less interested in the consistency of her career path. Being a spice runner got her the basics, and that's all she cared about. She didn't have a home in Tatooine. The place where her grandmother lived was given away to a poor family, something that Zena did personally. Her reputation as a ghost continued to be her calling card, if you will. She did her job, and then she vanished. While she was never reliant on Anakin, she did see his change over the past couple years, never believing her place to change him or fix him, if you will, rather just consistently observing who he was. It didn't dissuade her from trusting him anymore, just made her a little bit more cautious around him. Because she didn't have an official place to stay, she found her comfort on the rooftops of buildings, looking at the moons and the stars. Something that always stuck with her was a scar, one that was shared between both her and Skywalker. It wasn't intentional, but one mission, their jobs intersected, and he was chasing down someone as she was leaving the facility on Hypori. Her squad had finished their spice run, and they were preparing to deliver the products to Nal Hutta when a man ran past her. She happened to be in the way, and he had a knife with him. It slashed her across her palm, and she tripped him. It all happened so fast. Running at what seemed to be super speeds, Anakin was behind the man. He leapt forward and jumped on the man he was pursuing, beating him to a pulp, but not before being cut across the back of his hand. Zena had a scar on the palm of her right hand, and Anakin had one on the back of his right hand. It was a way for them to simply remember each other. So in that way, they were always with each other, no matter where they were. Something Anakin would do, if she wasn't around when he was back from a mission, was leave little treasure hunts behind. Sometimes there would be little gifts for her, things he found off-world or even trophies he'd acquired. She thought it to be endearing, and she kept each of these trinkets in her backpack, along with all of her other personal effects. Anakin had always wanted to give a girl a shawl that had belonged to him his entire life. It was his mother's, but she gave it to him when he was a boy to comfort him. He'd always dreamed of giving that to someone he loved. So, the trinkets to him were his only way of doing that, considering the shawl burned up in the house that exploded. At the moment, Skywalker was returning from Zygeria. Jabba sent him there to kill a slaver who dissipated the syndicate rules. It was a little mix-up, but Jabba had it out for the cat person for the longer part of a couple years. With Cad Bane taking up missions with the Separatists, it seemed imperative that the local boy take care of his little issue regarding the slaver. Just for fun, Anakin brought the man's head back on a silver platter for the syndicate leader. He wanted to continue proving his worth to Jabba, and he continued to do that here. Jabba was very pleased, and he paid up the little price and sent Skywalker away. Anakin returned to the city and searched for Zena finding her a mere 30 minutes after landing. It was close to sunset and he saw her looking for a place to sleep. She smiled when she saw him and waved him up as she climbed up to the side of the building and set down a folded blanket to keep sand off her clothes. When he got to the roof, he smiled and asked her how she was. Her warm smile was the best part of coming back. She tugged at his hand and pulled him over towards her and he got down next to her. They sat with their faces not more than a foot away from each other. There wasn't a word said, but the presence of each other was all that needed to be said. Zena told Anakin that she waited for this moment for so long. How many rotations had it been since they last saw each other? More than a hundred at the very least. She wrapped her hand behind his head and pulled it closer as her foreheads met in the middle. The warmth cooled the heat left behind by the setting suns. I've missed you. Well, it's about time you said something. It's been too long. I know. I believe there won't be many more jobs for a little while. Unless it comes from the Separatists. I'm sure it'll be a good break. Perhaps it will be. Only time will tell. Let's focus away from that. I heard an expression not long ago from a planet I visited for the Syndicate, and I think it fits you perfectly. Oh? What would that be? You are as pure as the driven snow, my love. What would that mean? She leaned back and smiled at him with a twinkle in her eyes. There was always something so remarkable about the way that she looked, though he had to admit that something felt off. He was unsure of what it was, but typically Zena wouldn't pull away from talking about bounty hunting. 
Maybe she just wanted some quality time not thinking about anything other than the moment they were in. Both of them were safe from their deadly and highly taxing jobs, and truthfully, that's all that mattered. As long as they were okay, there was nothing in the universe that could slow them down. Zena repositioned her bag to lean up nicely against a little hutch at the top of the building. The two of them leaned back and she pointed up at the stars, and she asked him where his favorite place in the galaxy was. Anakin pondered over his answers and came to the conclusion that it was right here. That was a perfectly curated response. They kept their conversation away from their careers, and they focused on each other, the soul of the other, their philosophical thoughts on life, the stars, the galaxy. They avoided politics of the ensuing war, and it was peaceful. They were cozy next to each other, so small in such a large galaxy, before either of them fell asleep. Zena pried a little. She asked Anakin if he ever thought of running away. He told her that he didn't really ever think of it. She just nodded her head and smiled before they fell asleep. Zen and Anakin pulled a little hood over them, one that would block out the suns in the morning. It would garner them some more sleep considering they had been up all night pretty much. When the morning came, they were both pretty tired, but they got up and moved down to a local cantina for some food. During their brunch, Anakin would be summoned to Jabba's palace. There was a new contract, and Anakin was very excited about it. The contract was exclusively Tatooine, so he wouldn't have to leave the planet again. It should be pretty simple, too. The way it was brought up over the little communication is that he'd be dealing with a lowlife. Zena smiled, content that Anakin would stay on planet. That was important to her. When Anakin arrived at the palace, he was strapping up the belts on his holster. And when his turn was up, he stepped before the almighty Jabba. The quest was simple. Someone had been stealing from the Syndicate. Tragically, it was someone that Skywalker was familiar with. Considering this was someone who was brought into the Hut Syndicate by him, he was being dispatched to deal with it. Anakin's heart sunk into his stomach when he saw the hologram of Zena pop up. She was a spice runner, and one of Jabba's henchmen noted that her shipments continued to have missing grams. These weren't large numbers, but they added up over the years. Anakin couldn't believe it. He didn't understand. But Jabba made it extremely clear. His job was to kill her. No mercy. It was either loyalty to his friend or loyalty to the Syndicate. Anakin took the mission and left the throne room. As he made his way to the hangar, he stopped in the stairwell and contemplated everything he had known up until this point. He served the huts, and they were good to him. But Zena was so much to him as well. What mattered most to him? Anakin took the hologram and brought it into the vessel and flew back to the city. Anakin was taking his time with his endeavor, and as he returned to the city and finally got a courage to leave the ship, he had made his decision. By the time he actually stepped off the ramp, it was starting to become nighttime, which would make this task a little harder. Zena seemed off, and perhaps she was worried about this. She must have known it was coming. Suppose she did. Anakin didn't want to lose her trust. It was something that she had expressed so much over the past couple years of its importance to her. He went to the location they were last at, and sure enough, her backpack was there. But she wasn't, so Anakin looked around for her. His heart was racing. He had come to his conclusion. But could he truly do it? Could he go to the path he wanted and throw everything away? So much was at stake in this moment. He called her name with a dull whisper, his voice cracking under the pressure. Trust was so big to her. Had he broken her trust? He was unsure. He heard rumbling from a couple cans from the alleyway, very similar to the one they were in when they first met. Anakin walked down the alleyway a little cautiously, afraid that perhaps she had turned on him. What a twist that would be. His anxiety rose. He looked around, slowing down when he came to her jacket. That was odd. He reached down to grab it and he felt the little jab under his right hand. He pulled back and saw one of the trinkets he had given her. It was a poison dart he got from his only job with Jango Fat. Blood rushed his head. As Fury ripped out of his chest, his whisper vanished and he called out her name, demanding to know where she was. Believing that she'd intentionally tried to poison him, he pulled his blaster from his holster and then turned the corner. He saw a shadow dart around the alleyway, and without missing a beat, he fired. Three shots echoed out into the night, and he ran forward, believing he saw her clipped. Anakin ran forward and stumbled as he slipped into the sands before sliding around the corner of the alleyway. A sandstorm was coming. He saw blood on the wall showing that he must have landed a hit. Anakin ran out into the sands and saw a couple footsteps, but just as Zena Pax had always been, like a ghost, the footsteps vanished. Anakin pulled his pistol and shot out into the air, firing in every direction as the sandstorm covered his body. Blinded by the winds and the air as he ducked back into the alleyway to examine what would likely kill him, and then he realized that he wasn't feeling any different. As he ran back to the jacket, he was surprised. Typically, Jango's darts kicked in by this point, and when he realized he wasn't feeling any different, he ran back to the jacket. As he got to the jacket, he saw the poison dart was empty. The actual poison inside the dart was right next to the dart itself. Anakin realized what he had done. He turned back and looked for Zena, hoping that she would magically reappear. Trust was always so important to her, and without that trust, then there was nothing. Was there a secret message in what she said? As pure as driven snow? Renvar, perhaps, or even Maigido? He didn't know. His eyes drifted back down towards the jacket, and he slowly picked it up. 
his anger and his panic slowing down, his heart slipping further into his stomach. He pulled the jacket to his nose and his mind was filled with countless memories within a moment. His fist balled around the corners of the jacket, forming tighter and tighter the more the seconds passed by. Skywalker looked down and then stood up. His eyes were heavy, yet no tears escaped from them. His heart was left mangled, but he had no one else to blame but himself. He had chosen his path. Xana never wanted him dead. She perhaps wanted to run away with him. She knew the bounty was on her end, and as she knew that chances are that Jabba would force Anakin to choose her or him. She probably put the dart there with it because his reaction would tell her of his intentions. If he was calm and collected, he would notice that there was no way that she would actually harm him. It was a very smart play made by her. What made the tragedy even more heart-wrenching is that his ghost, Zena, was only taking away from the syndicate to give to others. Every time she ran spice, she took a couple grams and gifted them to the poorest people in the streets of Mos Espa. These individuals could use the spice and sell it back to others. Typically, Zena gave it to small families in need of food, because in most cases, aside from one or two, the family would sell the spice back to the syndicate for a solid price and they would feed themselves. It wasn't much, but it was enough to help people get on their feet a little. Zena just wanted to help those around her, and she wished that Anakin would have stayed the path she believed he was once on. Maybe she had misjudged his character when they were younger, but she always believed he was good at heart. Perhaps he would be able to find his path later on, but there would be no more Anakin and Zena, or Pax and Skywalker. She was hopeful for the chances, but they were gone. So just as she was before, always acting as a ghost, she vanished the sandstorm. Anakin had no proof of her death, so he had to hope that Jabba would buy the story. Luckily for him, Jabba would. He would see the disappearance of Zena Pax as an affirmative truth that Skywalker completed the task. Though the fear Anakin had before he found her, or her jacket, was that he was throwing everything away. Truly a remarkable travesty and dilemma as regardless of his choice, he'd be throwing everything away anyways. Choosing the Syndicate meant he would lose Zena, someone who was all he had left. Choosing Zena meant he would lose the Syndicate, something that would likely hunt him and her down, but wouldn't exhaust his resources to do so. Did she mean pure as driven snow in the way to draw him to a snow-covered planet, or did she say it because she truly believed he was unsullied, truly pure? It was as haunting as a curiosity of her living or dying. Did she die of her wounds, or did she escape? She just vanished, which in a way worked for Skywalker. He could play it off in his own personal gain as he returned to work for Jabba, but for his mindset, he could never forget her. She was always with him, and the scar on the back of his right hand would remind him of that. It was his dominant, gunslinging hand too the one that pulled the trigger on Zena Pax before she vanished from his life forever. Could he still hold on to those memories now that they had passed? His thoughts dwelling on the smell of her jacket. It was the last piece of her aside from her footsteps that led into the desolate sandstorm that took her from him. Anakin returned the fob to the almighty Jabba the Hutt. He was rewarded with praise from him. Instead of Skywalker's chest, he could feel twisting and turning. He looked to the side of the room. Jabba had a man frozen in carbonite to the side of the wall. He was a decoration. He'd be freed in the coming days and fed to the Sarlacc pit, with a couple of other prisoners that were unlucky enough to face Jabba's wrath. The hut leader didn't have any missions for Anakin, but that didn't deter Skywalker from anything. He knew that he wouldn't have any jobs from the Syndicate for now. Zena knew that too, aside from the bounty on her head. So Anakin was left with nothing other than what he had said to Zena. Perhaps the Separatists were looking for bounty hunters, and sure enough they were. Anakin took the dragon's eye off of Tatooine and decided that he would now be leaving his past behind. He'd forget his mother, C-3PO, Jalem, and Zena Pax. He'd become the most feared bounty hunter in the galaxy. His regret over Zena Pax only led him to become more cynical, more brooding, more evil. He would be able to truly become the bounty hunter he wanted to be now. He was talented and he was ruthless, but now decided that he could be better than Jango Fett or Cad Bane. Skywalker pressed the hyperdrive down and his vessel jumped to hyperspace. Skywalker got up from the cockpit and walked to the back of the vessel. He stood in the bay area. Inside of it, there were an arrangement of outfits, weapons, and even something he had just installed which was a carbon freezing chamber. It was small, but it did the job. Working on his own meant he needed it, but it set him back thousands of credits and in turn cost him close to a dozen or so jobs to have been done. A lot of work for something so integral to his workflow. Anakin looked around and kicked a crate to the middle of the bay. The box shuffled across the floor, coming to a standstill on the side of the hole. His fists balled and his brows firmed. This would be so much harder than he initially realized. His eyes caught the sight of the scar tightening across his hand, and rage seethed through his body. He raised his hand and threw it forward into the wall. After the first swing, he continued going until he couldn't anymore. When he realized the little that that accomplished, he fell to the ground and felt his hand trembling after having beat it into what could only be described as a bloody mess. Anakin held his hand for a moment, just to get it to stop trembling. He looked over to the crate he kicked and pulled it closer, removing the lid and pulling out some back to patches. 
He felt the pain shooting from his hand into his wrist. It was pathetic. He wrapped a white cloth around his hand and looked at the back of the patches before removing a couple and planting them around his knuckles. When he was finished, he pulled a small stint and injected it right above the scar in his hand. What a fool he was. His frustration and anger only continued to convince him he was being so foolish for trusting her. Once he finished taking care of his hand, he got up and moved to the cockpit, and slept until he arrived at the planet Sereno. There was a fleet present and they hailed him upon his entrance from hyperspace. He informed them that he was here to take up a job from Count Dooku. The droids on the command deck gave him permission to land. His vessel sped through the blockade, keeping a safe distance. Moments after clearing the blockade, a wing of vulture droids would oversee his flight down to the castle. Luckily for Skywalker, he was the first one to get here. Cad Bay was on Coruscant and he'd be doing a job for Darth Sidious soon, for a holocron heist or something. Dooku inversely needed heads to roll, so once the bounty hunter ship landed, he walked out. Initially the Count thought it to be Bosk, considering the Trandoshan bounty hunter also flew a YV-666 class freighter, but it was just a boy. How odd. Dooku called out to the young man asking for his name. Skywalker shot back with his full name and Dooku asked where he was from. It didn't matter, but he was just simply curious. He couldn't hire any scum for this job. He needed it to be done efficiently. Anakin told him he was from Tatooine and he was one of the top prospects on the planet. Truthfully, that wasn't saying much. Tatooine had plenty of scum. Tons of people who wanted to make it. But they couldn't because they were just wannabes. Anakin didn't have that vibe. He carried himself with poise and confidence. His boots clicked as he walked down the ramp of his ship and stopped. A slight sway of his hips had him looking ready to pull his pistol. A typical cool guy stance if you will. Skywalker could likely do that job. Not that it mattered to Dooku, he would get it done one way or another. He tossed Skywalker a fob and told him the mission details. He was going to build Bringy to capture the representative of the planet. Anakin looked on in curiosity because Dooku just stopped after that. He expressed that any means was necessary. The only thing is, the representative could not be harmed. Dooku continued to told Skywalker that the fob would vibrate when the Separatists arrived. He would have 20 seconds to vacate before the commando droids entered the facility. Anakin tried to understand what the purpose of this was, but then it registered that Dooku was forcing a neutral system to see the Separatists as heroes, as if the Republic sent the bounty hunter to capture the representative of the planet. Before Skywalker left, Dooku gave him a warning. The Republic had been trying to sway Bill Bringy to their side of the war effort. If they were to notice the representative being captured, they might send their own commandos. Anakin nodded his head and turned back to his vessel. He set coordinates for the planet and departed. Before his arrival, he picked out his outfits and so forth. He gathered everything he wanted. Skywalker had a jacket that he always loved to wear when he was near the inner rim or the core. It was more up to their standards. The truth is, he stole it after one of his first assassinations in the mid rim. He took it from the guy's closet because the man he assassinated was pretty much the same size as him. Anakin grabbed his K-16 blaster and spun it around in his fingers before putting it into his holster. His hand was stiff, and that was an issue. He couldn't be playing a game like that, so if he truly wanted to be prepared for the potential of running into Republic or Separatist forces, he needed an alternative weapon. Luckily, he was a bit of a hoarder, an organized one at that. He liked his little trinkets, and he grabbed one that he liked a lot. It was a kill on a Mandalorian mercenary. He took the wrist thingy, Anakin didn't know the technical name for it, but it shot out little grapple, which was pretty rad to him. He also pulled a slug thrower off the wall and slung the strap over his head. Anakin really began to realize how stiff his fingers were. That would be an issue. While he was ambidextrous to an extent, simply through practicing his quick draw with both hands, he realized that he'd be a bit of a disadvantage if he came into a real firefight. His hand was really bruised up, which was entirely his fault for beating the hull of his ship. Skywalker got everything he needed and decided to try and just tough it out for as long as he could. When he eventually arrived at Bill Bringy, he landed inside the port of the city. He just needed an easy way to escape, but that shouldn't be troublesome. The representative's palace was pretty large. It overshadowed most of the city, so he could probably manage to escape if he was clever. He just needed to be ready for potential threats. Skywalker moved into the city without being discreet. He filled in with just about everyone else, aside from the slug thrower over his shoulder. It wasn't the most common thing to be allowed in inner rim planets, considering it was considered uncivilized, but most people in Bill Bringy didn't care. There had been problems with pirates in the past, and if someone could fight off those pirates, then it was not a big deal. People just assumed that he was either a pirate, or he would fight them off if they came. As long as he didn't do anything stupid, no one really paid him any mind. Skywalker walked through the streets until he got to the official building of the representative. He saw the guards standing outside of it, and he thought that was pretty silly. Having guards would do him no good. Skywalker knocked his left hand against the side of the palace as he sauntered around the large building. When he found a piece of the wall that was hollow, he put a charge next to it and blew a hole into the wall, large enough for him to jump into it. The alarms didn't sound because it was on the back side of the facility, away from the most common street areas. 
Anakin entered the palace and followed the sound of voices. He avoided guards and kept his eyes peeled for anything that could be a threat to him. Then he found it, the representative's family. Skywalker stalked them. The man was talking about the threats from the pirates and how they needed protection from one or the other. He was leaning towards the Republic. While his family wanted to remain neutral, Skywalker thought this would be a better time than ever to walk on out and make himself known. He pulled his pistol from his belt and pointed it forward, telling them that he would make the choice for them. The representative turned around and panicked. How did this bounty hunter sneak in? The representative got in front of the family, calling for his guards. A couple of them came running quickly, but Skywalker shot them dead before blasting the control panel to the door. He then told the man that there was no negotiating. Either he would come with him or someone would die. Anakin reached out his other hand and waved the representative over, but he didn't react. Skywalker pulled the trigger and dropped one of the representative's younger family members. Probably a son or a nephew, didn't matter. He told him to come quickly or someone else might die. The representative panicked. His natural instinct was to see if the boy was alright, which was the worst mistake he could make. Skywalker was pressed for time, and he wasn't playing around. He was going to be the best bounty hunter in the galaxy, and no one would stand in his way. As he moved around the table, what appeared to be the representative's wife ran at him. Skywalker kicked the chair into her knees and shot her as she toppled over. The representative got up in a panicked state, trying to ease the bounty hunter from any more carnage. Obviously, by this point, the sounds of blaster shots got the attention of the guards, and much more. The representative told his youngest to remain calm, but how could she? Seven years old, she just watched her mother and older brother get dropped without a second thought. Skywalker pulled the representative forward, and he fell to the ground. Anakin looked down at the man and asked if he really wanted to play those games. His weapon cocked him back and aimed it at the little girl standing silently in the chaos unfolding around her. The representative got to his feet and stumbled forward. The doors opened up and the guards piled in. Skywalker shoved the representative over, slapping his K-16 into the holster and pulling the slug thrower from his back and unloaded into the guards. Three of the men dropped within the firing of the first shot. Anakin's right hand recoiled from the pain of firing the big gun. He cocked it back and unloaded another shot, tearing down a couple more guards before Skywalker cocked the weapon again and slung it back over his shoulder. His eyes looked at the representative in a way that suggested that if he didn't get up, the last of his family would be killed. The man told Anakin that the Republic would never stand for this type of behavior. Skywalker pulled the representative's wrist and tightened the grip around it. He told him that the Republic sent him to do this. He was lucky it wasn't the Syndicate. He couldn't believe this. Why would the Republic send a bounty hunter after him and his family? Skywalker pushed him forward and told him that he would be a human shield, so he better make sure his guards knew what was best for them. His name was Ambitus Rex, but Skywalker didn't care. He shoved him forward and placed his K-16 on the top of his shoulder and pointed it forward. They pressed throughout the building. Anakin was only buying time until the Separatist commanders arrived and dealt with his politician. Guards came forward and they couldn't shoot, but they could be shot, which is what Skywalker did. His pistol vibrating on the politician's shoulders as they moved throughout the lovely hall, lining the floors with dead bodies of those meant to protect the family. As they continued stalling for time, a massive blast came from behind Skywalker. He threw Ambitus into the wall and spun around the corner. When Representative Rex got up, he looked over and called for help. But when Republic commandos entered the facility, he realized that the setup had been complete. The clones asked if he was alright, but they would never hear the answer. Anakin rolled around the corner, unloading a blast from his slug thrower, sending one of the troopers into the wall. He pushed forward as the clones tried to react appropriately, firing at him. Skywalker effortlessly evaded their shots, as if he could see them before they came at him. He pulled out a small vibro blade and turned it on, slashing forward with his left hand. He pulled out his pistol and used it as a hand-to-hand -hand combat weapon, smashing a clone's visor so hard it broke, sending glass into the trooper's eyes. The yell of pain was all the more pleasure for the bounty hunter. Anakin jabbed the blade into the necks of one of the troopers, before fending off an attack made by the boss of the crew. It was fisticuffs, and Skywalkers trained like Republic commanders were. He was beat back and thrown to the ground, and pinned down. Another commando, one who had glass in his eyes, prepared to stun Skywalker. Anakin looked for a way out of it, then he remembered. He was so grateful for Jango and their mission together. A small rocket boost launched Anakin's knee forward. It hurt like hell when he connected with the edge of the commander's backpack, but it threw him off a of Skywalker. Anakin kicked forward, sweeping his legs out from under the commando in front of him. He pulled the weapon of the trooper and tried to fire it before realizing that Republic Commando gear could be only used by Republic Commandos. It was a hand recognition software. Skywalker whipped the weapon across the room as it clipped the boss in the head. Anakin grabbed his blade and jabbed it through the open visor of the commando on the ground, before turning back and seeing the boss grab his weapon, pairing the fire a lethal round into the bounty hunter. Skywalker shot his grapple. It didn't wrap up the commando, it went straight through his leg. Well, that would have to suffice. Skywalker slipped forward and grabbed the pistol firing into the commando's chest a number of times until his body slipped over and fell. Anakin took a deep breath and got up. Footsteps could be heard behind him as he turned back and a dozen or so guards came running forward. 
He grabbed the dead commando's droid popper and rolled it forward. As the bomb went off, electrocuting each of the guards, he charged a thermal detonator and tossed it at their feet. The panic in their eyes as they were frozen in place was all the more fitting the Skywalker. The explosion killed them all. He turned back to grab Ambitus Rex. They continued through the halls, and as they did, his pocket started the buzz. He'd make this a good show. He brought Representative Rex to the top of the building. The man thought he was about to die, but Skywalker just told him that he would haunt his every night. He kicked him to the ground and looked for his ship, or at least that's what he said he was doing. Until, oh no, the Separatist, who would have ever guessed them showing up, Skywalker shot a couple of the commando droids, dropping one or two of them before throwing a smoke bomb and pretending to grab Ambitus Rex, but slipping. It was all a timing thing, because as he did this, a small vessel was flying away, so it looked like, once the smoke cleared, Anakin escaped into the air. There was a rope loosely hanging around Ambitus' legs, as if Anakin were to pull him into the ship with his legs first. Skywalker, on the other hand, jumped off the roof and prayed that his grapple would land. It did, however the landing wasn't pleasant. He slammed into a couple pedestrians on the way to the ground, but it cushioned his fall, helping him not break all of his bones in the process. Aside from the rough landing, Anakin was able to escape Bill Bringy perfectly fine. Ambitus Rex, on the other hand, had to play with the devil. It was only right. While his family didn't deserve the pain they incurred, Ambitus Rex was by definition a corrupt ruler. It wouldn't be fair to call him a representative or a politician because he was much worse than that. The next three years of the Clone Wars would be very similar for Skywalker, being that his contract with the Huts was pretty much extinguished. Shortly after Jabba's son was taken by the Separatists and returned by the Jedi, Count Dooku put a hit out for any bounty hunter to claim. They had to be able to kill a Jedi and deliver their body to Castle Sereno for a lump sum of a million credits. This was something Anakin had to take up on. He didn't really see a reason why the Jedi should be treated any differently than any other bounty. The only difference was the lightsabers, but thanks to his mission with Jango, he knew how to kill them. Not every Jedi was a hero of the Republic. Not every Jedi was a master on the High Council, so those who weren't could be taken advantage of. Jango expressed that their biggest weakness was their compassion, so Skywalker used their compassion, bombing a clone barracks and then executing a master and apprentice duo on the outskirts of a world, just for sort of a sport thing. Anakin would hunt down and execute the rest of the clones at the outpost for fun as well. Maybe it wasn't the nicest thing in the galaxy to do, but he got his million credits for it, well actually technically too. Anakin during the duration of the Clone Wars would become more distanced from the Syndicate, which didn't affect him as much as he thought it would. Truthfully, he sucked up to Dooku a little bit, because he believed that Count Dooku would at some point be in control over the galaxy. This allowed Cad Bane and Anakin to become good friends, which for bounty hunters meant they respected each other and stayed away from each other's missions. Unless it was a collaborative effort, Anakin continued to become more cynical as the Clone Wars transpired, but he got a kick out of killing clones. He may have looked up the Jango, but he was disgusted in the Republic taking advantage of Jango's genome. To him, the clones weren't even half the men that Jango was. Of course, this was simply because Anakin never stayed around the clones long enough to see them for who they really were. The war came crashing down with the rise of the Galactic Empire. Individuals like Cad Bane returned to serving the syndicates due to their anti-establishment stances. While Bane worked for Sidious, it wasn't the same as working for the Empire, so he returned to the Pikes, Huts, Black Suns, and Zygerians for work. Skywalker, on the other hand, known as one of the best in the galaxy at the game, decided to take some leave. Due to having killed two Jedi during the war and severely injuring Councilmember Kiade Mundi, he racked up around 3.5 million credits. Dooku gave him an extra 1.5 million due to his job against Kiade Mundi. Nothing personal, just war. Dooku died when the war came to an end and the death wasn't very explainable. No one even really knew what happened to him. Some said it was an assassination by the Jedi, but that couldn't be true considering they were wiped from the galaxy after a siege at Coruscant. Skywalker, instead of retiring, went into light work. In his time having worked for the CIS, he had a reputation as the Jedi Hunter, something created by the clones. The new Imperial power hired him for hunting down parties of clone troopers who went AWOL, though these tasks did include the murder of Jedi Padawans who lost their path. The payments were really good, not as good as CIS Jedi kills paid, but half a million credits was doable. The entire time, Skywalker continued modifying the dragon's eye and saving as much as he could. When he wasn't doing jobs, he was stopping off at gambling planets around the galaxy. His favorite place was Canto Bite, but the issue is, Anakin was trying to be a big shot. Most of the tables on the planet started around 250,000 credits, and they only went up from there. This meant that if Anakin was to gamble, he'd be putting his entire fortune on the line. Luckily for him, he had a way of knowing which card we pulled next in the game of Sabacc, so there was always packed tables of roulette and craps. Of course, the big thing at Cantobite was the racetrack. The big deals were on the lower odd fathiers and whether they would win or not. Anakin had luck on the tables, especially Sabacc and roulette. 
but when it came to the racetrack, he kept his bets to a minimum. Unlike the high stakes tables inside the casino on the planet, racetrack bets started around 10,000 credits, so it was much easier for random people to get into the game. Anakin loved putting his odds on fathers with 17 to 1 chances of winning or around that area. They were usually the cheapest bets to begin with, but they paid the highest if they won. Anakin only bet on them twice. The first time was a terrible failure. The father died on the track during the race. The second one, Anakin was having a long night in the casino, and he threw it away in a drunken stupor. He already threw out 750 grand on a roulette table after going up against the young gambler who was making a name for himself. He was also known as a master codebreaker as well. When Skywalker bet on the 17 to 1, he accidentally added a decimal point, so instead of betting 10,000 like he was hoping to, he ended up putting out 100,000, which he had just not with him. That's kind of a big deal on Cantobite. Their security was really big on paying up to the house if you lost a bet. If one didn't pay up, then you were locked up until someone could bring you your funds. If no one showed up by the end of the week, they would be sentenced and convicted. Cantobite ran off of gambling alone. It was an upper class society for a reason. Skywalker's bet may have been accidental, but with 17 to 1 odds, he brought home a payout of 1.8 million credits. To think that he didn't even need to almost kill a Jedi Council member to earn that much. Skywalker continued doing this little game for the next several years. He didn't really have anything else to do aside from picking up contracts of the Empire. He really began to resent the Syndicate system, considering Jabba didn't take too kindly to him not coming home anymore. There are low lowlifes from Tatooine always sent out to kill him, just as he had gone out to kill Zena Pax. There was really a certain irony in that. Skywalker avoided the Hutts like a plague. Every time one of the local kids came to fight him, he would have to kill them. It wasn't fun, but it was easy. He did inversely get to loot them for stuff he liked. Sometimes he'd take a pistol or a couple credits. It was that former person still within him. Anakin had a bit of an imposter syndrome when it came to his wealth. He still thought he had to fight to stay anywhere, when in reality, he could stay anywhere he wanted. He had a solid saving of credits and he didn't spend everything, aside from at the tables of Canto Bite and sometimes Numidian in Prime, which is where he met the young Lando Calrissian, who was a master of the Sabacc table, but a bit of a cheater too. Anakin liked the kid. He was well-rounded, and he had a great swagger about him, though they never spent much more time around each other. Their only time was buddies at the gambling table. As his journey continued over the years, earning a reputation with the Empire as an A-list bounty hunter, he began to fall out with some of his allies from the days of the Clone Wars, one of which being Cad Bane. It was easy to tell that they wouldn't remain friends forever, simply due to Skywalker taking up jobs with the Empire. In 9 BBY, Skywalker is brought to an Imperial Star Destroyer and informed by the Emperor's Enforcer that he was going to be sent to Obadiah to kill a syndicate leader. Anakin never pondered over questions of why or what happened. He just needed the fob and he went on his way. Though the Enforcer liked the talk, he was big and had a boisterous personality. Not that he had one when he was serving the Jedi Order during the Clone Wars, but now that he had power under his Emperor, his ego was larger than life. Palm Crow was his name, and he went by Lord Illur, or Darth, whichever. Skywalker didn't care. Palm noted that there was a powerful essence, but he never made a move on it. Much like how Dooku believed that if there was a force essence within the bounty hunter, then it would be his very undoing. Both Pong and Dooku at different points believed that if they made a mention of the potential of Skywalker even having the force, then they would be removed. They weren't sure if it was imagination or superstition. The only concrete thing for both Dooku and Pong Krell is that they refused to try and touch it. They wanted nothing to do with unleashing any power that he might have. Skywalker was told his payment would be close to around 5.7 million credits. The reason the Empire had such a high payment is the Empire was going to get his revenge. There was a weird dynamic between the Empire and the Syndicates. The Imperial Reserve had accounts in the Outer Rim that were constantly being funded by the slave trade, and the more illegal businesses typically done by criminal organizations. The Empire allowed these organizations to maintain their power because it meant the Empire wouldn't have to funnel resources into the Outer Rim to deal with it. This dynamic allowed both the Syndicates and the Empire to have their own space, and because Crimson Dawn never rose, there was never an issue until now. One of the leaders of the Pike Syndicate had been embezzling funds from an account on Castle. To be fair, the Syndicate leader had no clue the account was secret or codenamed account for the Empire, but in doing this, there was no going back. The Empire didn't just forgive, they made examples, and because they made examples, they would deal with it. Skywalker was the only bounty hunter willing to go up against the Pikes. Maybe because it was personal for him, they were still participating in slavery. Or maybe it was because he would kill anything that moved, as long as it paid. All that mattered to the Empire is that someone would get the job done. The payment he received was half of what the Empire would have had to pay for Imperial Storm Commanders to do it. Though the Empire could not risk the information getting out that Imperial Elite units were storming the Syndicates due to an accounting issue on Kessel. 
to the wider galaxy, aside from the Emperor and his little pets, there was no Imperial influence in the Outer Rim. People were okay with looking away from the Outer Rim because to the Mid-Rim and Core World people, they weren't the same, they were lesser beings, so a mission like this was required to be done in secrecy, hence the hiring of a bounty hunter. Initially, the Empire would have hired multiple, but no one aside from Skywalker and Dengar showed up. Dengar backed out not wanting to be hunted by the Syndicate for the rest of his life. Skywalker was already being hunted, and if they could cripple the Syndicate head, then it wouldn't be an issue to fend off more thugs on the daily. He entered his ship, and he was given a number of supplies by the Empire. Detonators, rockets, his vessel was even given fuel, and his ammo was filled up. They also lent him a KX series droid, just for this mission alone. They knew he was going alone, and it was much easier to pass off a bounty hunter stealing a KX droid than the Empire using a bunch of them. It was treading delicately over glass in a way. Skywalker had his plan laid out. They would land away from the palace on Obadiah, and they would sneak into the facility because he had been here a number of times, so he knew it relatively well. After everything was packed up, the vessel lifted out of the hangar bay and departed for Obadiah. As he was gathering up his supplies, the KX droid picked some things up and handed it to him, expressing that it was knocked out of his cot when the droid accidentally bumped it. Anakin looked over at the droid and held it in his hands. He couldn't believe it. Thirteen years had gone by since he last seen his ghost. What a tragedy that Xenopax had been gone for so long. But not a day went by when he didn't think about her, about the non-lethal dart, and all the time that passed since they last saw each other. He often wondered if she made it off of Tatooine, and if she did, where she may have run off to. The little object was one of the trinkets he was going to give her. It was actually the one he got from his final mission before going to her. It was an earring, a mismatched pair. Zena always liked to wear different earrings on each ear. She thought it was funny, and she believed it was a good way to see her in a crowd. Zena knew how elusive she was, and she always wanted Anakin to be able to find her. He brought this earring so that he'd express to her that he always wanted the ability to find her. Before he left to go and meet up with her the night before he got the bounty on her, he lost the earring. He searched for it for hours, and he could never find it. Even the night he was meant to go and find her, the hunter, he searched for it, believing that if he could find it, he could find her. There came a point when he stopped searching for it, and just believed that, as she was, the earring was a figment of his imagination, a ghost if you will. What a shame, too. She would have loved it. Anakin's heart sank into his stomach. The KX droid informed him of the jump to hyperspace, and he felt the engines kick on and blast off into the direction of the Pike Syndicate homeworld. Anakin held the earring, and he tried to look for a place to get rid of it. But the longer he held it, the more memories he could see. The times of Mos Espa, their first meeting, the peace, the warmth, the comfort. She was everything to him. Did he have everything, or did he throw everything away? It's not like he could ever escape her. The scar was always visible on his hand. He tried to cover it up, but he never could. It just remained with him. Permanent, like the scar she left on his heart. Skywalker walked over to the cot and placed the earring down on the pillow, expressing to himself that the day would come when he could get rid of it. He told the strategy to the KX droid and everything that would be done. The cold responses of the lethal Imperial drone just continued to ice his heart. He turned the sympathetic side of him off and switched into his hunting gear. He would kill these slavers and make them bay. Truthfully, he was told to kill one of them, but the Empire didn't know which one, so essentially, he was given permission to figure it out or kill them all, whichever was easiest. They arrived under the cover of darkness and landed out in the barren lands of the planet. Skywalker was quick to move with a crate of supplies hovering behind him. As he pushed it towards the palace, Anakin's plan included surviving, and he made sure that he would survive. After what felt like hours of trotting along, he got to the edge of the palace, just like he had at Bilbringing. But instead of just trying to plant a hole in the side, he started to scale the palace. The Pikes, unlike Representative Rex, had everything on lockdown. The only thing they didn't have were sensors for climbers on the side of their building. It was partially an ego thing, partially a thing of who would dare do that? Skywalker would dare. He climbed up the massive structure with the crate next to him. He was able to scale the side of the palace going sideways, so he was covered by the mist and fog before reaching a platform where he could safely climb up. He looked around making sure all was clear before opening up a door of the interior of the facility. The coast was clear in here as well. Anakin threw a small sensor to the side of the platform where he had just come from. The sensor was for the KX droid. He intended to escape the same way he came in, just flying on the way out instead. Skywalker quickly moved through the halls, opening up the top of the crate and emptying out explosives all over the walls. The crate he had was still filled to the brim, so instead of moving through the facility, he returned to where he entered at and took some of the climbing equipment and placed the box that in of itself was an explosive over top a doorway that led to a platform. With everything seemingly fine, he returned to the facility and snapped the necks of any unlucky grunts who could face him. Skywalker kept close to the walls, avoiding large groups of Pike members. He made sure when he killed a body that he hid it wherever he could. His main concern were the leaders, and as he slowly got closer to the throne room, he noticed that there were a lot more enemies than he remembered being here. The Pike seemingly increased security, believing that the Empire would come for them. 
but that wasn't the case. Without Crimson Dawn, there was no criminal organization the Empire cracked down on. Anakin peeked around the corner until he heard a couple Pike's members call out to him. Anakin looked back and then pulled his pistol. He then released three thermal imploders into the throne room and then listened as the chaos unfolded as explosions sounded off one after the other. And then he turned his pistol on the grunts running his way. He opened fire, ripping into them. A number of them dropped into the ground as he rolled back around the corner into the throne room which was set ablaze. Anakin saw one of the syndicate leaders running out of the room and saw a number of grunts who were drawn to the sound of the massive explosion. Skywalker turned towards the sound of the footsteps and grabbed his pistol and prepared for a fight. He grabbed the plaster from one of the grunts and pulled it to his non-dominant hand. Anakin followed the shadow out of the room as more grunts piled in from where he was coming from. His feet slid across the floor as he turned the corner seeing the shadowed man running from the bounty hunter. As Anakin slid, the blaster flipped out of his hand as he tried to steady himself by planting his hand on the ground. He jolted upwards in a full sprint, his hair flowing through the air as he avoided any shots coming his way. Anakin was surprised when he saw more guards coming from in front of him. He knew that he'd be trapped if he didn't act fast. A trick he picked up from Jango's son, Boba, who'd become a friend of his, little brother-like in a way, was little rockets on his knees. So Anakin high-stepped with his knee and rockets blasted out, slamming into Syndicate members as he turned back, using his last thermal imploder and watching the guns try to escape its explosion radius. Their screams sounded off as he rounded the corner following the elusive Syndicate leader. Anakin wasn't going to let someone else escape, not this time. He had a job to complete. He needed to make sure this worked for him. Skywalker picked up his speed and slammed into walls, mostly because he had to take corners so fast. Each time he did, he lost his pace and he had to try and catch up again. Skywalker saw his opportunities that came to a long hallway. A shot rang out and the syndicate leader toppled to the ground. Anakin smiled before his calf was clipped and he slammed down to the ground himself. It was a hard drop because it was so unexpected. Anakin rolled off the ground and turned back to see who it was, as he saw his old buddy, Cad Bane, standing tall and silently with his pistol slapped back into his holster. Anakin felt his calf and then turned back to the syndicate leader, who was currently being surrounded at the moment. The syndicate boss was helped off the ground and he demanded that Bane kill the bounty hunter. All of his friends and allies were dead because of Skywalker. It was time he paid the ultimate price. The boss knew that the Hutts had been lazily hunting Skywalker for years. It'd be a real treat to gain some credit from Jabba by sending him this new wall decoration. It would also be a show of camaraderie between the syndicate powers. Cad Bane looked down at Skywalker and reminded him that the Empire would sell him out. Anakin placed his weapon to his holster as he held it to his feet. He told Bane that he wouldn't have gotten so far without the Empire. Cad just shook his head, admitting that he always liked him, but he was wrong in this. Anakin was so talented, he never needed the Empire. He only wasted his life away for them. They were no different than the Republic, just a corrupt system taking advantage of anyone else. He was so disappointed. Cad expressed that Anakin would have been one of the best. Anakin gritted his teeth. He was eaten up by these comments. He shrugged his shoulders and placed his foot on the ground a little harder. Bane shook his head, insinuating that Anakin should not try it, but Cad knew Skywalker all too well. He would do it, and he would throw his life away, again. Anakin's injured leg ate him up, but he forced the leg to remain sturdy on the ground. The Pikes knew Bane had the quickest hand in the galaxy, so they let him have this moment. Anakin and Cad, two longtime allies, torn apart by a singular job. Their hands hovered over their pistols, not a single one of them moved. The air was still, the hall was silent. Every single breath stalled in the moment. No one wanted to miss this. They knew what was about to happen. Skywalker would be in a body bag, and Cad would continue his reign as a longtime champion as the quickest hand in the galaxy. Their eyes met each other. Neither one of them blinked. Each and every member of the Syndicate waited for the body to drop. Truthfully, Skywalker was uneasy. If he killed Bane, he needed to get out of this. Luckily, he knew how to. But the most important task was surviving Cad Bane. Their hands uneasy, their fingers twisting above their holsters, the blasters both idle under the shadow of their hands. In a split second, both of them pulled their blasters and fired away. Anakin was hit first, his collarbone pierced by the blaster bolt, the blaster ripping out the back of his shoulder. Bane wasn't any luckier, as he was thrown back by a shot in his abdomen. The Syndicate members were all surprised. I don't want you dead, but I'm not gonna save you. Anakin pressed down on his wrist and fires exploded in the walls as he pulled his jacket over his head to protect himself. The sound wasn't nearly as bad as the smell. He was so fortunate the Syndicate leader led him to the hall he booby-trapped. If he hadn't, then Anakin would be long dead. Skywalker lifted his head to see the destruction and carnage around him. He couldn't believe it. There was a clear path to escape. Anakin grabbed his blaster, holstered it, and used his hands to press his wounded body off the ground. When he hit the device on his wrist, he signaled the KX as well as triggering the explosives. He grabbed his vibro blade and ran to the Syndicate boss who was still alive. Anakin grabbed the man by the throat and whispered into his ear something that he didn't believe in, but he thought it'd be a cool way to end someone's life. Long live the Empire. He pulled the boss's head off before throwing down a bundle of smoke bombs and disappearing. 
Anakin was able to get to the ship before anyone noticed, but there were grunts who followed their way outside. Because Anakin wanted to send a message of spite to the Syndicate, he pulled out a cycler rifle and aimed it at the little box he left behind, and slowed his breathing. The KX held the ship steady and he pulled the trigger, killing off a couple dozen more pikes just for the fun of it. Anakin pulled the rifle back and looked at the area, not seeing a sign of Cad Bane. He turned back and entered the vessel as the KX droid pulled the dragon's eye through the atmosphere and then into hyperspace. Anakin would deliver the head of the Syndicate leader to Lord Iller on his personal destroyer. He would be paid his credits and he would be sent on his way. Obviously Anakin now had a price on his head, but because the Empire liked him, they suggested he stay away from the Outer Rim and Mid-Rim. Truthfully, he'd be safe anywhere from Alderaan than Chandrilia. Canto Bite was probably also safe, but it wasn't under Imperial occupation, so there could be no quote-unquote protection. The main essence being, the Empire saw Skywalker as an asset, but they would never openly protect a criminal. He was still scum, just useful scum. Anakin, none the wiser, didn't realize how little the Empire cared about him, but it was still more than anyone else did. Skywalker left the Imperial Destroyer, leaving behind the Kayak droid, which was the closest thing to a companion he had in a long time. When he jumped to hyperspace, he returned to his favorite place in the galaxy, and he would continue to spend credits at the luxurious casino on Canto Bight. With so many credits though, he would ensure the Dragon's Eye had everything up to date. Being so good with his hands as a mechanic really aided him here because he was able to understand his vessel from the moment he bought it and continued to get a good grip on it in the years since his purchase. By this point, he knew the entire thing inside out, so he could take it apart and refurbish it if he wanted or needed, though he didn't need to. The ship was juiced up to go faster than it usually was and initially designed to go. The reinforced hull in the exterior allowed it to tank damage but also go fast, which is what Skywalker loved the most. So, since he had all these extra credits, he decided that he would spend time on a new friend, buying himself a little droid. Though the only issue is that the droid and him didn't exactly bond. They were fine with each other, comfortable being the best and most quality word to describe the dynamic between the two of them. Anakin couldn't stay on Canto Bite for long though. He knew that the Syndicate was hunting him down, and thanks to Boba, he was able to know when the Syndicate was closing on, on its location. The bounty hunters, for the most part, were never much trouble for him. Anakin moved from Canto Bite to Alderaan for a little while, before bouncing off the checkout Coruscant and the sites there for a period of time. Anakin's issue over the years was his inability to sit still. He always needed to be doing something, or on the move, or whatever. Because of that, he was always flying around. It cost credits, but he had over 10 million before he started this little hiatus. That was mostly in part thanks to the generosity of the Empire. He would take their calls from time to time, but the one burden that sat within him was if he really killed his friend or not. He thought that he gave Cad Bane a fair chance to escape, but no one had heard anything of Cad since the incident on Obadia. While the syndicates didn't explicitly blame the Empire, they realized that they could be in danger if they got too big. Most of the syndicates, believing that the reason the Empire struck at Obadiah was because of how large the Pike Syndicate had become. Obviously, that wasn't the case, but it didn't really matter. Anakin's little endeavor to the Pike homeworld shook the criminal empires to their core. They were all under the impression that Imperial Storm Commandos were responsible for it. The years that followed the incident, Anakin would serve the Empire as best as he could, but his attention to their cause started to fade. He would date around a little bit, but having a name like his, it was clear that there was no relationship possible for him. He was a notorious bounty hunter, and while it may have elicited short-term excitement, there was no slow burn. Everything burnt out and extinguished in moments as two people met and then never saw each other again. The cycle continued to eat away at him. All the while, he kept to his own. As he continued serving the Empire, he watched it slowly lose power, as he realized that all of his life, he was chasing realities that meant nothing. He had wonderful stories, but... With the Empire crumbling, his circles got smaller and smaller. The belief was that once the Alliance won the Civil War with the Empire, they would hunt him down and execute him for his crimes against the galaxy. But in reality, Skywalker knew the truth. He wouldn't be burdened by the Alliance when it rose to power. Unlike the Syndicate or the Empire, they wouldn't hunt him down. He may have served the Empire, but he wasn't considered by the public to be a loyalist. The few rebels he encountered never lived to tell the tale of their encounter anyways. And in many ways, he over the years became more like his beloved Zen of Pax. He was able to disappear like a ghost and become a shadow in the galaxy. By the time of his 45th birthday, the Empire would seemingly fall apart at the Battle of Endor. Despite how cut off Skywalker was for most real relationships, he was able to do trade in secrets or even rumors. At the gambling tables on Canto Bight, he would learn of the rumors circulating around the destruction of another super weapon at Endor. The warmongers who sold to the Alliance and Empire were all big betters on Canto Bight. They talked and Anakin listened. Of course, there were alternative means for trading of secrets, which Anakin took pleasure in as well. Rumor had it that a Jedi Knight named Astrid Kree's Kenobi went to the Emperor's throne room over Endor and was the only survivor, having gone into a room with the Emperor and his enforcer Pong Krell. 
She was known as a force of terror to Imperials. She also survived an explosion that ripped the second battle station apart. Daughter of the Duchess of Mandalore and the former Jedi Knight Obi-Wan Kenobi, she was a new era of Jedi, according to rumors at least. Being that she used a code name for her last name, she was able to hide her identity as a Kreeze, keeping her Mandalorian people safe. The name she used was something like Jin. During this year, the year that the Empire would sing its final song, Anakin would have his run-in with one person who finally treated him unlike a renowned bounty hunter. He had his reputation, but she saw more to him than just that. Despite his isolation over the years, Skywalker held himself very highly, he was always very poised and wearing an upper-class uniform. While it may have been a bit less modest by Canto Bight and Inner Rim standards, people didn't care. He was Anakin Skywalker, the quickest shot in the galaxy. As the Empire fell, Anakin would run into the upper-class Princess of Amor. It was a mid-rim world, and she was here spending her family's money because she hated the idea of being pinned up inside the palace all day. She knew of Skywalker because her mother called a bounty on her uncle when she was 24. Anakin was only 26 when he did the bounty. Now they were 45 and 44 she only a year and a half younger than he. They met at the high stakes craps table, before switching to roulette and then their final stop of the night at the dragon's eye. Anakin expected her to leave in the morning, but she didn't, and from there, he and Kala well were pretty much inseparable. They spent time getting to know each other and know who the other was. Anakin by this point had outlived the syndicate leaders who had any interest in him. Those who were still alive during his peak years stopped caring. They knew it was just wasting resources. Skywalker was no longer working for an empire that would send him after them. They called it a draw. Just let bygones be bygones. Skywalker, in reality, was the victor of the match. He and Kala would continue spending time with each other on a rather consistent basis. She would bring him back to Velmor, but she wouldn't be brought to Tatooine. One day, as they were solidifying their bond with each other, Kala found a dusty earring inside the dragon's eye. They'd been open with each other about everything from each other's past, so Kala didn't care that it probably belonged to a one-night memory. Of course, that wasn't the truth. Anakin had lied. A part of him never wanted to let go, but he knew he couldn't even if he wanted to. The travesty about the jewelry that he would have given the Zena is that Kala started to wear the piece consistently. She was in love with his vibrant beauty. It had this allure to it, and she treasured it as if he had gone to a cluster of stars and handpicked it just for her. Obviously, she knew that someone who was just a blur in his memory had left it behind in an early morning escape from the vessel, the reality never being revealed to her. Anakin would find a semblance of happiness with her, but to Kala, he always seemed so cold and turned off from his emotions. She chalked it up to his past as the fastest gunslinger in the galaxy, but that was only partially true. Anakin, in the bottom of his heart, knew that Kala, no matter what she did, would never fill that hole in his chest. She would never be the first and only love he ever had. All the accolades in his life could never replace what had been lost, though the relationship would be healthy. The two of them would have a child before they hit their 50s. She'd be a daughter, and the two parents would name her Zena Ozano Skywalker. Kala loved the name Zena. She told Anakin that she heard it in a dream, and she wanted to keep the name forever. She was open to any other names, but Anakin was so flabbergasted that in the time he had to come up with an alternative name, he couldn't find one. So instead, he contributed to Asano's, being that it was a popular royal name from Velmore. It was a way for him in his own mind to show appreciation for Kala, and she interpreted it as such. The pain of his little girl being named after a haunting would only pull at him. But the reality is, Anakin couldn't be miserable. He and his new family were well off. They had each other and that's all he could ever ask for. Because for the first time since he was a young man on Tatooine, he chose something other than an unattainable prize. It was lonely on top, and so he went to his family, and he found a new sense of completion. He would interact with his, who he considered younger brother, Boba Fett, from time to time, but he would learn to live a life without the toxicity of kill or be killed mentality. Luckily, he was the greatest bounty hunter of his generation, and it came with a luxury he acquired. While he was responsible for the death of his friend Cad Bane, he would never know what happened to the lovely ghost girl from Tatooine. Sometimes Anakin would look to the night sky, whether it be on Velmore with his family, or at Canto Bite with his wife, and he could feel Zena Pax. Anakin could always feel her eyes on him, and when he turned back to see her, she was again, gone like a ghost. Like a whisper, too sweet to hold on to, too quiet to last forever. And that, my friends, is our 100,000 subscriber special. Thank you to all the patrons and all of you for making this happen. I am eternally grateful for hitting this milestone, and I can't wait to continue going to the future with you guys and keep telling these awesome stories with you all. 99! Holy guys, it's 99. Oh! We did it! We did it! We did it! So let's talk about this 100,000 subscriber special story. The main thing that I really wanted to focus on was like, what choice did Anakin choose? Obviously he's a bounty hunter, 
but I always want to like make the story feel a little bit more tangible. Like, yeah, we have the bounties and the story of him actually being a bounty hunter, but that that choice, what did he give up? Like, I wanted that illusion to be with you the entire time. What was he giving up in that moment that he chose the syndicate over Zena? Like, was he getting everything or was he giving up everything? And that dilemma, I wanted to sit with you until the end of the story. And it's still kind of up to your own interpretation if he actually got everything in the end or if he gave everything up. But that's kind of the whole idea I wanted to go with. Like this kind of like this this idea that's going to live with you for a little bit after the story ends and be like, well, this is what I think or this is what you think. Obviously, I have my own interpretation of it, but I want you guys to have your own. I think that caps this off is probably the best story I've told on this channel. I hope you all enjoyed it. Thank you all again for 100,000 subscribers. I, I can't I can't believe it. Thank you guys so much. I love you all as always. And remember, my friends, may the force be with you. Thank you.